Hello everyone and good morning. Welcome to Year 1 FMS Orientation D3. Today on our program, we have three presenters. I hope students are not being affected by this weather too much. There's a lot of rain outside, so please bear in mind sometimes the connection isn't always the best. Um, in order to help your bandwidth, if you have on your video, you can take it off so that that way it can conserve some of that. Um, we have today a featured presentation by Dr. Sahu, who is first up, he's going to talk about an introduction to PBL, which is a very important part of your curriculum. And Dr. Sahu is a lecturer in curriculum development at the Center for Medical Sciences Education in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. He has done a PhD in education and specializes in curriculum development. He has more than 10 years of experience in designing yeah. curriculums, mapping, and evaluation. He has expertise and teacher education, which has contributed into the faculty development for over 10 years. Some of his current professional activities include <laughs> conducting workshops on the problem-based learning, mapping an MBBS curriculum, monitoring the PBL groups, and preparing for educational program documents in the Caribbean Accreditation Authority for Education in Medicine and other health professionals. He has published over 24 journals and 20 research articles and has two books on education, medical education and mental health. Good morning, Dr. Sahu. Thank you for joining us this morning and facilitating our first segment. We welcome you to our orientation. Thank you, Rihanna. So, now I'm going to share a screen. Okay, good morning students and welcome to the Faculty of Medical Sciences. As Rihanna was telling, this problem-based learning PBL is one of the integral part of our curriculum. So you might be studying different methodology, different methods of teaching in your school level. Here, this is one additional thing you are going to learn that is problem-based learning. So in actually when I present a delivery lecture in face to face, I ask a few questions to connect myself with the students but because online is a little difficult, but not so difficult. I have a question for you that you can choose the option problem-based learning. Class is a place where students, which one is correct? Sit meet and eat, listen, remain silent and go, go home. Receive, receive means here receive knowledge, interact, create knowledge and reflect or make fun and run. What do you think? Which one is correct? Oh, very nice means, you know, PBL, before coming to this lecture also, you already know, that's very nice. So, as PBL is a new approach for all of you, and especially in MBBS and other health professionals, you are going to part of this problem-based learning. So, you should not enter to the PBL class without having knowledge of this, what exactly the PBL, how the process, everything. So in today's presentation, we will be able to know about the meaning and concept of PBL, what are the essential characteristics, and how, because of pandemic, you know, we are going to online PBL. So what is the difference between online PBL and face-to-face -face PBL? What are the steps? Most important thing is, you must have the knowledge of steps of PBL. Then only you can go ahead. And in PBL, we select uh, out among the group, one will be the leader, one of the will be the scribe. So we have to understand what are the roles of leader, scribe, and group, group member. Then, of course, there are many advantages and some limitations of PBL. That also we have to understand before we go. So what is PBL? Let us understand PBL from the pioneer of PBL. You see how PBL came to medical science. 
This from McMaster University, they established a medical college and it was decided that instead of the traditional teaching and learning like lecture, let's give opportunity to the students so the students can involve themselves, they can learn by themselves, and that is completely based on learner-centered approach. So that was the motto, and uh, the pioneer was Barrow and his colleagues, and they successfully implemented PBL, and after that, it spread it to other places like McMaster University, and then Maastricht University, then Newcastle, and now all over the world, wherever you go, especially in health professional, you will find PBL as one of the most important learning method. Basically, this is learner center. That's a good thing. So how Barrow has defined PBL, it is a learning method based on the principle of using problems as a starting point for the acquisition and integration of new knowledge. Here, two, three things you'll be able to understand now. The problem as a starting point, one, and integration of new knowledge and creation of knowledge. So in order to understand the definition in detail, I have defined one PBL. This is my definition that I think reading this definition, definitely you'll understand the meaning of PBL properly. The problem-based learning is a learner center and self-directed learning approach where a small group of students participate actively in the learning process, applying knowledge, skills to resolve an ill-structured problem, engaging critical and collaborative learning behavior. So I have highlighted a few important um, uh, criteria or characteristics of this PBL, you will be able to understand soon. So learner center approach, self-directed, small group, active participation, ill-structured problem, critical thinking and collaborative learning behavior. These are the essential features that we are going to learn now. So this is basically PBL. So let us see what are the essential feature of uh, PBL. Basically, this time we have online PBL. So, definitely in online PBL, the first or essential feature is online mode of learning. Then self learning small group learning, self-directed learning, problem as a starting point, in structure problem, everything we are going to discuss now. So, critical thinking, collaborative learning, constructive learning, long-term learning. So these are the features, let's see one by one. So what is online mode of learning? You know, this generation know technology better than us. And the good thing about, sometimes we think positive about negative thing. COVID came and we had a lot of learning experience. Even in school, now school children know online, so we don't need to tell what is the importance of online teaching and learning. So these days, because of COVID pandemic, we have to bear with this online mode of learning. And that's why this is the most essential feature that without necessary de device, without internet connectivity, you cannot log in or you cannot join in the class. So this is one of the essential feature. The second one is self-discipline, especially in online learning. You have to maintain self-discipline. Suppose in a class, if a tutor or if the leader or if the group scribe will always tell you, okay, please mute your mic, please unmute your mic, please do this, which that is, a wastage of time. So you have to manage yourself properly, how to appear, whether you need to appear in video or audio, everything you have to be, uh, you have to understand and maintain self-discipline. So my, my, the tutor or the leader should not tell you again and again, do this, do that. That will kill the time. So self-discipline is one of the essential feature. 
especially in online this learning platform, than small group. The good thing about PDL is you are going to learn whatever the concept and whatever the process you are going to follow in PDL, that is in small group. I think I don't need to tell the what is the importance or advantages of small group. The best thing is you might be seen in large group, it's very difficult to interact. Students, even they want to ask questions, they, they will not be able to ask, especially in medical science, suppose 100 students, 50 students, 200 students want to ask a question or clarify your doubts, not possible. But in small group, each and every one of the group members will get opportunity to ask questions, to participate, to contribute. And if you see few students in a group, even if small group, they don't like to speak their side, kind of, they don't like to participate. But here you have to participate. And because of your active participation, the best part is you are going to improve your communication skills. And these days, Without communication skills, you cannot survive in any field. So this is one of the best part of PBL that is small group and you are getting so many benefits from this. Self-directed learning, as this is learner center, although there will be a tutor for you in the class, in a small group, but he's not going to, he or she is not going to teach you, just a facilitator. What are you doing? How you are going to participate? How you are involved? Who is participating? Who is not? It is the job of the tutor to see and just prompt the participants. But you as a learner, you learn by yourself a concept in a self-directed way in different steps. When we'll understand the step, you'll know how you are going to participate as self-directed learner. Problem as a starting point. You might have seen, not might, you have seen that in your lecture, class, discussion, in previously in school level also, you are witness of different kind of class. One is lecture. Let in lecture, what happened? A lecture or a teacher comes and say, students, dear students, today we are going to learn this and this. And this is the meaning, this is the type. This way the step goes, okay? And finally, the teacher asks some question and then go. But here in PBL, problem is the starting point. Means a problem will be, or a scenario, or a case will be given to you, and the PBL will start from that point. You see, this don't need to read this one. Problem looks like this, okay? And this problem will be given to you by your My eLearning platform. I hope you, all the students have already received the My eLearning password and your ID. If not, you'll get soon and you are going to use. And in My eLearning, the course convener will send this problem to you either one hour before or one day before the PBL starts. So you'll get this problem and PBL starts from this problem only. So problem, that's where problem is the starting point. One of the essential feature is yield structure problem. So what is the difference between yield structure and well structure problem? A well structure problem is you have a problem and there is a solution, suppose you you say, I'm feeling hungry. What I'm going to do now? So solution is there. So eat some food, finish. So that is where uh, solution is. Or the, you don't need to worry about how to solve the problem. It's easy to solve the problem in the well-structured problem. But in structure, you have to discuss, you have to brainstorm, you have to collaborate and interact and participate actively and do a small research and go Google or library or any other sources, and you have to find out the problem. First, you have to find out what are the objectives, the steps that we are going to discuss now. Then you have to get the solution of the problem. So little ill structure, the solution is not within the problem. You have to find out. 
that is the best part of this PBL. Critical thinking. Just compare yourself in what you did in your lecture on the previous classes. The teachers were teaching to you and you were listening and cramming, memorizing whatever he was teaching and writing in the examination. So this PBL is not like that. So what you have going to do, you have to think critically that, okay, COVID pandemic, how to protect ourselves from this pandemic? And this health worker, these days they have a lot of mental health issues. How to get rid of this problem? So you have to think critically, then only you get the solution. Uh, each and every, the good thing about this PBL that each and every uh, participant or member or student has to think critically, not just about one student. Every student has to think critically and then only the PBL process will go on. Collaborate learning. Small group is a teamwork. You have to work as a team. It's not one person will solve all the problem. Suppose you are going to find out the issues. What are the issues or what are the challenges here in this problem? So if one person is saying something, another person will or another student is going to add something. Other students, they will uh, agree or disagree. This way the PBL will go on from problem selection or from the step one to end of the step, you have to work together and that's how PBL goes. Constructive learning. So this is the difference between what you learned previously and what you are going to learn. In previously in school A level, whatever you learn, you wrote in the examination and you got marks. But here you will not only learn you, will, you are going to create a new knowledge based on your previous knowledge. That's why it's constructive learning. Means before coming to the PBL classes, you are going to attend your lectures, normal class, and learn something like some anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, whatever you are going to learn. You are coming to PBL class, and based on your previous knowledge, you will contribute and create a new knowledge. That's why it's called as constructive learning. The lifelong, lifelong learning. What is the best part of the PBL is, you are the leader. You are the lead actors. So when you are participating actively Doing to do something, that thing you remember for a long time, long time. Just imagine whatever I'm teaching or you are learning in a class, maybe 10%, 20% you remember, or 50% you remember, you remember for 10 days, then you forget. But when you are participating actively in the PBA, you will not forget. That's why it's called lifelong learning. So these are the essential features of PBL and especially online PBL. Let us see how this online PBL is different from face-to-face -face PBL. Is there any differences? Yes, definitely. Uh, you, you have not experienced face-to-face -face PBL. What our students were doing, uh, they were using some devices, no doubt, but it was not mandatory like they were uh, using laptop or iPad, tablet or projector, but it was not mandatory. Some of the students were using also you know, whiteboard and without, they were coming without any devices. But now in online, it's mandatory and mode is online mode. Earlier it was face-to-face -face mode. So digital literacy is required. You must have the knowledge, the basic knowledge, not deep knowledge, basic knowledge, how to and how not to use the online devices. And then in face-to-face, -face, it is no, not mandatory. Place of learning, earlier in physical face-to-face -face PBL, all small group students sitting in a class and learning, but now you can sit at your home, 
at any place where you have good inter internet connectivity. Discipline, as I have already told you, in online, you have to maintain self-discipline. Otherwise, it will be wastage of time and uh, your PBL cannot be more effective. Then in face-to-face, -face, discipline was because tutor was there and leader was there, so external basically, but self-discipline was also, you had to maintain self-discipline, but external was more. Attendance, you see in physical, uh, PBL, tutor was just writing who is present and who is not present. But here, although you log in, but your actual physical presence is difficult to know. Now, suppose there are today, I would say there are two more than 200 participating uh, participating participants attending this class, this lecture. But I don't know how many of you are actually attending or not sleeping, not going to your yard or somewhere. I don't know. So a little difficult. But in PBL, although it's difficult to measure, but not so difficult because it is a small group and the tutor will look who is participating and who is not participating. So in that way, not so difficult, but difficult as compared to face-to-face -face PBL. Communication like this thing, this part, especially in online, I really don't like. Or like I'm speaking, I cannot see you. You students are the strength. Suppose you are speaking to one another and you can't see, then what will, that may not create that much interest, but still we don't have any choice. So we, we can simply speak, but we don't know what is our non, uh, how our, our, our body is behaving, how our non-verbal behavior is, our communication is. We can't see in um, our online PBL. That is the, these are the differences. Otherwise in steps, the steps are same in online and in face-to-face -face PBL. What are the objectives of PBL? You know, in medical and health professional line, you have to be competent in your field. If you want a good doctor, or if you want a good dentist, you have to be competent in your area. And competent comprise three aspects. That is your knowledge in that area, your attitude, and your skills. If you just think about driving a car, if you say, I know how to drive a car, that is your knowledge. But if you don't know how, where exactly practically, practically you don't know how to use the brake, how to use the accelerator, then that is a problem. That is skill. And your attitude means where to stop. Suppose a person is crossing the road, whether you have to, how to stop, all these things, that is your attitude. Similarly in PBL, you are going to know your subject matter. Okay, anatomy or physiology, whatever you are learning, you learn, that is knowledge is okay. Other than that, skills, there are so many skills you are going to know through this PBL, like communication skill, research skill, leadership skill, which are required in your profession. Then attitude. So, this, these are some skills I have written. The theoretical knowledge, definitely. The critical thinking skill, self direct learning skill. These are the skills you are going to learn from this PBL. Then, in attitude, value of teamwork and interpersonal skills. Means your attitude is very much important in health profession. Like, if someone is speaking, you don't need to laugh, whether he, he may be wrong or right. But you don't need to laugh, you have to respect. So you have to respect and listen to them carefully and reply them accordingly. So also you will be able to know teamwork as I have already told. So these are the three main pillars or three objectives of PBL. Okay, now let us see how 
the seating arrangement will be in PBL. Earlier, our students were sitting like this in face-to-face -face classes. So leader, tutor, scribe, they can sit anywhere but semicircle, but it's up to you. Like tutor can sit in the middle or leader can sit anywhere. So this was the sitting arrangement. But now, unfortunately, uh, at least this semester, you are not going to sit like this and how it will go. So from your home, this is the setting, PBL setting. But one thing you have to remember, internet connectivity. It should be strong enough to log in and to participate in PBL. Let us understand the steps of PBL in our Faculty of Medical Science, which has been adopted like from Master's seven jump method. So I'm going to ask you after my presentation, number one question will be, how many steps are there in PBL? So in PBL, there are seven steps. You have to understand now. Step number one, identification and clarification of unfamiliar words and phrases. Step number two, problem analysis and identification of the main issues. Three, hypothesis formulation. Four, identification of student-generated learning objectives. Five, self-directed study, a private study. Six, problem resolution and knowledge consolidation. And seven is application of new knowledge to problem. So our students, I always tell, you don't need to remember these long words. I have highlighted in uh, like uh, step number one, unfamiliar words and phrases. Even while the scribe will write on the board or on the uh, MS Word document, this day online uh, Google doc, you don't need to write this whole uh, name, identification and clarification of unfamiliar words and phrases. Simply write unfamiliar words and phrases. Okay, finish. Step number two, issues or main issues or learning issues. And step number three, hypothesis. Step number four, objectives or learning objectives. Step number five, self-directed study. And six is problem resolution. And seven, application of new knowledge. So now I think you remember the step. There are seven steps. You don't need to understand, uh, remember whole name, simply uh, what I have highlighted in black that you have to remember. Okay, all se seven steps will be completed in two sessions. First session is known as brainstorming session. That is from step one to step four. This is very much important. Step one to step, step four, that is called brainstorming session. And step six and seven, known as discussion session. And in between, there is a, that is not session, you get, get seven days time to research. That is called self-directed study. So what we understand, there are seven steps. And seven steps, there are two sessions. One is brainstorming. We are going to discuss all these steps in detail. Brainstorming session. And then one week gap. Suppose the PBL will start on Monday, okay? You are coming on Monday. Day one, only step number one to four. Then go home, study and do research and come following week. Next Monday, first finish step number six and seven. That is called discussion, okay? Then once these two steps finish, start another problem. Problem number one finished, then start problem number two. That's why this PBL goes on. So in between, you are getting one week time and you have to do research as yourself, you will define the objectives or identify the objectives and you do research and come and present that we are going to discuss soon. Okay, let us see. Suppose in year one, semester one, 
there are block system, one course, there are four PBL problems. Suppose there are four PBL problems. The day one, your PBL will start a little late. Suppose the timing is 9 to 12. Day one, it will start at 10, 10 o'clock. Why? You don't need three hours of time. Total PBL, one problem takes three hours to finish. You have to manage the time, okay? So three hour times, but day one, because you are not going following all step one to seven, it will not take three hours. So you are given two hours time so that you can introduce yourself in a small group and then start the problem, which take around 90 minutes or 100 minutes. So that's why first day, first problem, only brainstorming, you will be given only two hours time, week one. Then what happened? Week two, you are coming to week two. First, you finish your case one or problem one discussion part. Finish, then uh, go to problem number two and start the brainstorming, stop. Then following week, finish the problem two and start the problem number three. And that's why it goes at the end you should have only discussion that also take 90 minutes. So, or hundred minutes, it's up to you or depending upon the nature of the problem. So then the first day and the last day, you'll given only two hours. So if there are four problems in PBL, it will last for five weeks. So if there are six problems in PBL, that will last for seven weeks. Okay, let us understand what exactly you are going to do in step one, step two. Just thing, when I am saying step one, you remember what did I say? Step one is unfamiliar words and phrases. What does it mean? This is very simple step. You will be given a problem or case or scenario. I have taken this from one of the PBL booklet of FMS. So this is a problem. One, one of the student will be the reader of this problem. It's anyone can read, but I have seen students volunteer that I'm going to read. Okay, that's a good thing. One student will volunteer and read the problem. While going through reading through the problem line by line, suppose there are 15 students. One student is going to read the problem. Rest of the 14 students will identify the unfamiliar words and phrases. While reading, I found some unfamiliar words that I don't know. So I have highlighted. Now you just have a look. You don't need to read even. You can read one paragraph, first paragraph. So when you are read, reading this problem, line by line, one person is reading, the rest of the students will find out the unfamiliar words that they don't know or they are not familiar, then they will tell to the scribe, as I told, and we'll discuss about the scribe, there will be one scribe in a group, the scribe will note down the unfamiliar word told by the students. Then, in this way, the reader will read the whole problem, and out of this, you can find out five unfamiliar words or 10 unfamiliar words, it depends upon the problem. Then, after finding out unfamiliar words, you have to define those unfamiliar words. So I have already told, one student will read the problem, members state the unfamiliar words and phrases. Okay, while reading, because you are coming first time to this field, if you are, uh, you are not pronouncing properly, in that case, your tutor will guide you correct you, then you have to define this unfamiliar words from authentic sources. Uh, which one is good? Uh, earlier I was advising that use medical dictionary, but these day online days may not be possible. Well, you, you are going to see the medical dictionary and finding out the unfamiliar meaning of those words and the scribe has to write the meaning. So I have already told that there will be one scribe who is going to write 
those unfamiliar words and going to define those as told by the participants and other members of the group. So in this online PBL, I would suggest you to use Google Doc. If you don't know, just practice Google, Google Doc, go to Gmail and you'll find that. So that each and every student time. Otherwise, I have seen some students can also use um, MS Word document, but I would suggest Google Doc so that even after PBL is over also, you can use those. The second step, first step, very simple. That is identifying on familiar word and defining the, those words. Second is problem analysis and identification of the main issues. What is problem analysis or main issues? Means now you understand this problem because there were some unfamiliar words you have already defined now through some authentic sources. And because you have defined, now you understand the problem. So now we need to uh, find out the issues. What are the challenges? What are the issues? Again, the reader will read line by line and you have to identify the issues. So when you are identifying as a group members, you are going to discuss. Soon I'm going to show you a video, you can understand. So you are going to discuss based on your previous, as I told you, before coming to PBL, you will attend a PBL class, uh, sorry, a lecture uh, on anatomy, physiology, basic. So before coming to PBL, you have little or previous knowledge of this uh, uh, concept. So you will identify the issues based on your previous, uh, previous experience. Here, all students need to participate and identify what, has the, what are the important problems here and why do you think so? And these issues have to be written in question form. So once you have the issues, okay, these are the issues, then you have to find out the possible explanation. Okay, uh, these are the issues, these are the reason health workers are in problem or they have some difficulties. Now you have to think the possible solution or possible uh, explanation. That is called hypothesis. So suppose there are 10 issues, so address each issue and propose possible explanation. explanation. So 10 issues means there may be 10 hypotheses or sometime what happened, two issues make one hypothesis, that's okay. So one issue can have more than one hypothesis or sometime more than one issues can have one hypothesis. So depending upon what kind of issue you have, you found, then in that way, you'll find out the, uh, define the hypothesis and that may be hypothesis, suppose 10 issues, hypothesis may be more than 10 or less than 10 or exactly 10. So it's not a problem, okay? So the scribe has to write whatever issues, whatever hypothesis in Google Doc. I'm suggesting Google Doc, but if you find any other better option, you are feel free, feel free to use those uh, platform, not a problem. For each issue, possible explanation in different ways. As I told, we have system-based curriculum. Here in PBL, not even any problem, you will not find exclusively anatomy problem or exclusively biochemistry problem. Integrated, each and every problem you'll find anatomy, biochemistry, physiology in, in, integrated. So for that, you have to think in a broad perspective. And before that, you have the knowledge of all these aspects and think critically, integrate anatomy, physiology, epidemiology, pathology, everything and speak and contribute. And that's, uh, that's how you'll get the hypothesis. And identification of students, and this is learning objectives. Once you defined or identify issues and hypothesis, now this is the last step of brainstorming session. 
So every, in all the steps, one thing you must remember, each and every student has to participate. Don't think that few students are speaking, so I I'll, would I'll, I'll prefer to remain silent. Don't think about that. That is wrong. So that is not the purpose of PBL. The basic purpose of PBL, as I told, is small group and each and every student need to participate and contribute so that you'll get more confidence, build your communication skills. So there are so many reasons we have PBL here. So active participation is important for all the students. Now you have issues and hypotheses coming to framing learning um, objectives. Here issues in question form, hypothesis in statement form, and objectives are also in statement form, but you have to use some action verb at the beginning. Like in examination question, you have seen those uh, words, action verb. What are the action verb? Like explain, explain the difference and differentiate, describe, list, manage. You have to use those action verb while framing the learning objectives. So when you are framing the learning objectives, okay, today we are going, uh, going to find out the anything, anatomy of this something or neck or something. So in that way, in that case, you have to frame like explain the anatomy of neck, or whatever you have defined. So must be group agreement on all the learning objectives. It's not like that one student said and you all have to agree. Constructive argument sometimes is required. Suppose you are not happy with one of the objectives, you can say this is wrong and I think if we err like this, that would be very effective. And immediately other students will react. That is the good thing. If you participate actively, then you'll find what is wrong and what is right and you suggest accordingly. Each student has a stake and you can participate and contribute. So tutor and share learning objectives are focused, achievable, achievable, comprehensive and appropriate. So uh, you know, when you are framing, especially in year one, you may have little difficulty. Okay, we don't know this, how to frame the objectives, but don't worry, there will be a tutor for you and he or she will guide, not directly tell, okay, write these objectives line to line. He'll prompt you, okay, and you have problem only, but tutor has problem as well as objectives. Tutor, no, I'm showing you this. I don't know whether it, this is PBL booklet. So this booklet will be given to tutor. And in this booklet, problem is there. Along with the problem, objectives are there. You can't see, but you don't need to see also. Objectives are already there for the tutor. And he knows, she or she knows the objectives. Only thing is, you have to frame the objectives. When you are not able to frame any of the objectives, tutor will prompt you. Okay, you discussed everything, but you forget about management. What about the management of this? So you then in that case, you'll think, okay, I missed the man. We missed the management part, and with the prompt by the teacher, a tutor, you will frame those objectives missed by yourself, okay? Okay, now your brainstorming session is over. Step one to step four. The unfamiliar words, then issues, then hypothesis, then objectives. Finish, brainstorming session is over. Now go home. Sorry, you are already at home, where you go. So now your research time, whatever objectives you have framed, now you have to find out, go to the library or go to wherever, whatever the sources, but authentic and study yourself. This is also known as private study or research phase of PBL. So you are going to do a little bit of research to find out what are the objects. Like suppose you said, explain the concept of this. In order to understand the concept also, you have to search somewhere. So do research. Then each member to learn all the objectives. This point is, I would say this is important. 
suppose in a problem you frame seven objectives okay what you should do you all the students should learn all the objectives few students what they do okay few group they divide okay you learn you learn objective number 1 you learn objective number 2 and you learn objective number 3 but in online uh, platform this uh, pbl if you do like that what will happen in discussion session whatever you are you are learning you have to come and present in a using a ppt powerpoint presentation okay suppose one of the presenter is presenting and he lost uh, connectivity what will happen are you going to wait that student to come and present no so you have to ready and you uh, it is possible only when you all learn all the objectives so that's why i would suggest all of you learn all the objectives and in that way you don't need to wait any student is losing the connectivity and pbl smoothly utilize authentic online resources whatever online resources you are using these day you will you get everything in google but not necessarily all concept what you have received are correct so who what is authentic and not authentic you will be able to know while you are writing the references you write the references okay from i took this from this sources so that your tutor will see those references and say okay this is good one this is so don't forget to give the references while you are bringing any uh, concept from any of the sources then this day if i will say okay something i will say discuss this part of this what i will say okay not a problem okay bring information you can bring 100 of pages in one day easily because everything is available in internet but in pbl this is not allowed so whatever information you are collecting first you read yourself understand yourself and say yes this is the real answer of one objective number one is addressing through this then only you share your information to your group okay once you are ready okay you understand that this is appropriate for your objective then you share those um, thing information in your google doc so your research steps or private study step uh, finish what happened after framing the objectives you went to library or any online sources you search the information collect read the information and collected and share the document okay what will happen that document is in paragraph form you are you know that but while presenting you don't need to show the whole paragraph to the group you have to make a powerpoint presentation only like what i am doing i am not uh, presenting any paragraph here just points so you are exactly you are going to do that okay so that while you are presenting that could be more interesting i am again telling you that you don't need to present the paragraph or don't need to read from the text so now your step number 6 starts that is problem resolution and knowledge consolidation so what exactly you are going to do In online another suggestion i would like to give suppose there are seven objectives or eight objectives it means there are seven eight or 10 presenters whatever information you received you prepared in powerpoint and now it is a time to present whatever you have learned so if there are seven presenters and suppose one presenter is uh, sharing the screen and internet is gone what will happen again i told you that's to learn 
all the objectives all students should learn all the objectives number one thing number two whatever powerpoint presentation you are making either share in somewhere so that everyone can get that that power ppt okay or better give all your ppt to the scribe always think of backup means although there is a once there is one scribe but that information should also be with someone else so that in case scribe has the connectivity problem any other person can share those powerpoint presentation in the screen screen so suppose there are seven objectives better plug all merge all those ppt together and take it as a continuity so that it will save your time because time management is also important during presentation one thing you have to remember that presentation should not be so long short presentation because all students now know whatever objective all students know now now know the problem and now know what is the solution so instead of presenting for long time present little and discuss more maximum presentation time should be 5 minute not more than that but some of the concept is so long that you have to present may you may have to present for a long time in that case instead of presenting by one student divide that objective half of the presentation should be spoken by one student and other half should be spoken by another student the basic purpose of pbl is make in the pbl process more interesting and suppose one person is presenting for long time in pbl class that three hour one uh, person is dominating the class that would not be so interesting so short presentation if you are going to use any video one minute two minute not five minute or not 10 minute one minute two minute, small small clips use ppt and image diagram whatever you are going to use visible not very small visible so that it should more it should be more effective i have already told you why you are presenting don't read from the text one paragraph reading so what is the purpose of pbl you speak better communicate you know the thing and you are interacting your, with your student uh, friends so you don't need to read from the text then authentic sources i have already told you while you are presenting what are the possibilities of other students they have to ask question okay you told like this and what will be the consequences like you can ask question as a member only if you know about the concept that's why i'm telling you again and again learn all the objectives all the students have to learn time management don't forget time management is very much important 3 hours time after 3 hours you have to fill a yellow form and you have to submit to the course convener they will give maximum half an hour by that you have to submit a form so if you will not finish pbl within this given time then that is a, that will be a problem so who will be responsible for time management as a member definitely you are responsible but there will be a leader one leader will be selected leader as well as tutor will remind you that you have to finish the pbl within the time frame the last step i am telling you that some of the group they forget to follow the last step because of the uh, shortage of time but one day i will be in your class and i will make sure that you are following all seven steps and step number 7 seven is very easy and it takes only not more than 5 minutes so what i we did on familiar words we did not have knowledge of few of the we did not have any idea of few of the words or phrases we defined those words and phrases and then we understood the problem then we frame the issues by framing the issues also we did not have the solid knowledge proper knowledge of that 
uh, problem. Just with what we did, probable solution. We thought that that um, hypothesis, we framed the hypothesis thinking that this is the right thing we have did. But hypothesis may be correct or incorrect, okay? While you are framing hypothesis, that may be correct or incorrect. If correct, that is okay. If that hypothesis after doing research and up next week when you are coming, you realize that whatever hypothesis number two you framed, that was not correct. So you have to rewrite that, that hypothesis after getting knowledge and information. So what happened? Step number one, unfamiliar words. Step number two, issues. While framing the issues, you did not have the knowledge of PBL. Now, in step number seven, you already know uh, the, uh, the problem. Earlier, you did not have the knowledge of the problem. Now you knew the problem. Now you have already done the research. Now you have already discussed everything. So the same thing, now again, one reader has to read the problem line by line. While reading line by line, other student has to add, okay, from this line, we learn these things and kind of summarize, okay? Reading line by line and adding whatever you have learned from your research. That is called application of new knowledge. What you study and at the end, what you learn, you have to tell after reading line by line and adding whatever you have learned. So these are the steps. Let me ask you, how many steps are there in PBL? Can you tell me? Seven. Oh my God, I'm so happy. All of you are listening so attentively. I don't believe everyone is saying seven. So happy for this, eh? Okay, you don't need to write the name of the step. Mm. If any one of you could tell me what is step number one? Are you identify unfamiliar words and phrases? Okay, very nice. Okay, okay. Don't once any any one student is uh, writing, then no need to write all the students because I want to save the time. Okay, step number two. What is step number two? Understanding. Identifying objectives. Oh, wrong. Who is saying that? main issues. Yes. Issues are main issues. Step number one, unfamiliar words and phrase. Step number two, main issues. You don't need to write uh, uh, the long uh, words. Simply write main issues. Okay, main issues or issues. And what is step number three? Hypothesis. Hypothesis. Excellent, excellent. I'm so happy you are listening. And step number four? Objectives. Very good. Objective. Now, step number five? Self-directed. Self-directed study. study. I don't believe it. You remember? Everyone remember. Very nice. Step number six? Problem. Problem. Okay, and step number seven. Apply your creation of new knowledge. Okay, very nice. Okay, brainstorming session. How many steps are there? Four. 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 Yeah. So step number one to four, known as brainstorming session. And step number six and seven is known as what? Discussion. Discussion. Hold on. I, 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 hold on. Hold on. I, I, I'm really happy that you all are listening attentively. And I now I feel comfortable. Once you go to the, your PB class, you don't have any problem because you understand, you learn the steps. So these are the steps you have already told. Now mute your mic. Now please mute your mic. Okay. Number one to seven, brainstorming on familiar words and phrases. Step number two, issues. Three, hypotheses. Four, objectives. Five, 
this is in between session. The five is self-directed study. This is your research phase or private study. Six is problem resolution. And seven is application of new knowledge. Six and seven steps discussion. Okay, now let us try to go inside. Just close your eyes. No, don't close your eyes. Just think that you are going to a class, PBL class. What exactly we are going to do? Let's just think. Definitely, when we'll start the PBL class, first thing is your internet connectivity. I don't need to tell what is the importance of this connectivity, strong connectivity. Okay, some of the students might be staying in any remote areas. In that case, you come to your friend's house or uh, anywhere you can talk to your head or you have to come to a better place where you have a good internet connectivity and try not to get any external feedback. But some are natural like raining or that you can't avoid. But you see, more discipline, more effective. And you know what is discipline. Then once you have connectivity, log on to your my e-learning. Okay, do you have the access to my e-learning? Yes, we do. Yes, sir. Some okay. of us actually. Very nice. So, have you seen BBC? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. My problem is solved then. So I don't need to tell what is BBC. So. Uh, yes, so what? What we are going to do in your my learning only, you'll get your that problem. Okay, PBL problem you'll get, and you have to connect yourself in BBC. BBC is a platform we are using here in FMS as well as in the university. So those students who have my e-learning, they should not have any problem. But if any of the students they don't have my e-learning, they have to contact the course convener. Uh, he or she will guide you or any person who are dealing you, uh, you he can he or she can guide you then okay another big question is whether you should appear in video or audio we have debate throughout the year what should we do i always pre prefer prefer video because this is a small group and i want to see all the students but some of the students, they are not comfortable. That is one reason, so we cannot make it mandatory. It's up to you, but and also up to the tutor. Another challenges with the video is, so another challenges with the, uh, Rihanna, please read the comments. I, some of the students are saying no access yet. So maybe Rihanna would help you. So um, I was telling about the video inter interaction. So, uh, what happened last year, I did observation of few classes. Some of the students had connectivity issue. So in that case, video will not work. So it's up to you whether you are going to use video or not, but uh, your tutors, uh, when your tutor will come, he will be, you can see the tutor in video, but it, Regarding your students, uh, it is not mandatory, it's up to you. But while you are presenting your uh, research information, whatever you got, at that time, as a presenter, you should uh, appear in video so that whatever you are speaking, others should see you. That is my suggestion. Okay. In first week, okay, think because you are going to PBL for the first time. First week, definitely you are small in number, 15 students, 10 students. You should know each other. So your interaction, your hobbies, whatever you would like to say and just kind of introduction. Then a ground rule. You have to make, because this is self-directed learning. So you have to make ground rule, okay? So, uh, we have to log in at least five minutes be before or uh, whosoever will be the leader. You have to log in 10 or 15 minutes before so that he can check the mic and everything. And the scribe, scribe's role is very much important. So whether the scribe is able to share the screen or not, you have to experiment 
every corner of BBC will find some uh, uh, icon. Uh, you have to try what are those, and you can check those before, and so log on be well before time. And yes, a leader and a scribe will be selected. When first day or every problem, you have to uh, select a leader or a scribe. Better one per student, any students should volunteer that, oh, yes, I want to be leader today, and I want to be the scribe today. So once a student is leader, cannot be leader for next time in the whole problem. So the reason is every student, student should get opportunity to lead the group or scribe the problem. That's why one student can be a leader in a course for one time only. Okay, so better I would suggest volunteer is yourself as a leader or scribe. That will be helpful for you to improve your confidence level, communication level, and many more things. So you'll get benefit of that. Now this is my learning star portal, student portal. You know that. So in my learning, if you go out there, then go to BBC and BBC look like this. I think you have seen those who don't have access. Uh, I think you'll get soon. Now, you have already gone inside the PBL class. And as I told, there will be one leader. Suppose there are 13 students. One will be the leader and one will be the scribe and rest will be the members of the PBL group. And I, uh, I have already told you, there will be a tutor for all of you. Leader. First thing in online PBL is connectivity. If you don't have good internet connection, you cannot lead the group. So make sure that there is proper internet connectivity because leader's role is important. You have to lead the group. You have to speak frequently. So internet connectivity is most. Timely login. Suppose you start at nine, don't log in at nine. I have seen here today also, or in class, please don't log in after nine. Five minutes, you, are, you see this PBL is for your, your students, not for others. You are going to learn. So time management, how time management is possible if you are logging in time? Okay, what scribe is coming or leader is coming? Okay, I want to share this. I want, uh, I want to learn how to share this screen. When, after logging at nine, he's, just making experiment, learning. No, whatever you are making in a trial or anything learning, learn before nine, not after nine. So that will save your time. Login in time and whatever you want to learn, learn before the time. Get acquainted with BBC. I will, it will take five minutes to understand what is BBC, how to operate. So whatever you are learning, learn before nine. And focus on discipline. Although I told, in PBL, online PBL, self-discipline is important, but sometimes what happens? Suppose I ask you a question. What happened? Uh, many students at a time told, responded. That a kind of dist disturbance. In online, we can't avoid. In that case, leader has to control. Okay, okay, okay. One student has already responded. You don't need to respond, please. Then please don't uh, speak, keep quiet and mute your mic. That's, leader has to maintain the discipline. Although I told self-discipline, leader has to also look the discipline part of this PBL process. Then he will say, okay, friends, uh, today we have problem number one. Uh, we are going to do the brainstorming session as we have learned. So he will introduce the problem and invite participation. Okay, tell, what do you think about this? Like, suppose there are 13 students, you will definitely see few of the students will not like to participate. Although they know something, they say, okay, 
always uh, my peers are speaking and so uh, better not to speak he or she remains silent so in that case who will look uh, into that the leader has to see as well as the tutor because i am telling about leader leader has to see that whether all the students are participating equally and if any student is dominating the class or pbl the leader has to stop okay you have told already told this please allow other students to speak and that is the beauty of pbl so re give respect in pbl we are giving respect to each and every participant Uh, whether he is shy or he has la lack of knowledge of particular area but we are giving opportunity to each and every one so sometimes what happen students are so excited speak for long time and they forget about time management so in that case the leader has to say okay we are going uh, out of the track and please don't go that way and we have to manage the time and finally whatever the issues or hypothesis why framing hypothesis five students told five thing the leader will summarize okay based on the discussion or brainstorming of this hypothesis i think this one will be correct are you agree with me all students say yes we agree go ahead so agreement then if in case you lost the track as a leader and as a group you have any difficulty you can ask to your tutor and tutor will guide so this will be the role of scribe then uh, as i told you connectivity whether tutor or scribe or leader or members of the group connectivity is most important and timely login don't forget scribe role is to write so what is the difference between a secretary of a office and a scribe secretary write whatever he or she needs to write but scribe as a scribe you have to write and also take part actively in the discussion process brainstorming process whenever you get time you definitely ask question you definitely definitely contribute because you are also a student you know something you have also the previous knowledge you also want to speak so while framing the issues although you are writing also never forget to speak or contribute framing the issues hypothesis or any point of time whatever suppose some difficulty was you have also some unfamiliar words you don't remain silent you have to speak yes i don't know the meaning of this word so you have to participate actively along with writing whatever need to be written okay let's see what connectivity timely login i would suggest use google doc what is the benefit of google doc suppose once try uh, scribe is selected and he lose connectivity in that case any other students can write so that is the benefit so you have to open google doc then the process i have written this how you know this say google everyone know if anybody does doesn't know please tell me what is google now these day kg1 students pre school students also know what is google so you can see on the right nine dots if you click this uh, nine dot you'll get your google docs here click this one and you get uh, you'll find this google docs new you know all this so but you have to go this way also or any other i told you if you are going to use any other platform available i don't know it, it, it's up to you but i would suggest google doc so once you open this page you can share and everyone in your group can uh, see this google doc and i would suggest and i would request all of you because in google doc all the students can write here type here please don't do like that allow the scribe to write this would be the job of the scribe to write whatever uh, steps need to be written but when scribe is has connectivity problem in that case 
other student, the tutor can ask or leader can ask other any other student to write. So in online time, this is the benefit of Google Doc. Okay, let's see the role what we have discussed and what we have not discussed. Records on familiar terms and write the definition. First step, the scribe has to write its on familiar term. I have already told. Then the, the definition of that on familiar term. Then he has to or she has to share whatever writing on the BBC screen. And on familiar term, then what he or she has to write? Many issues. Suppose there are. And main issues, he has to write 10, uh, 10 main issues. Okay, one good thing about this uh, technology is, suppose a scribe is writing something and uh, uh, the leader found or uh, any of the mem group member found that, okay, this issue is wrong and you will li need a little modification. Immediately you can modify there. So that is not a problem. Issues, hypothesis, learning objectives, you have to write. And while writing, sometimes scribe may not hear what the members of the group contributed. He can, he or she can ask, oh, what did you say? That's then, as I have already told you, scribe along with writing on familiar terms, issues, hypotheses, and objectives, he or she has to contribute in all the steps. Brainstorming especially has to contribute and involve herself or himself actively in the PBL process. Okay, in Google Doc, you can do like, there are, I have uh, done two models to show you. One is this, okay, issue, uh, unfamiliar one, uh, terms at the top, issues, hypothesis, objectives. You can go like this, or you can do like this. It is up to you. Whichever you are comfortable, you can do. Like unfamiliar term at the top, issues, column one, then column two, hypothesis, three, objectives. If you are you ask me which one you like, I would say this model number two. Can I ask you which, what do you think? Which one is better? One or two? This is one. Okay, some of actually those, like two. I, I personally like two. One here you see issues will not be three. Issues will be more than three. Okay, ten, sometimes twelve. One, Second. one page issues will be finished. Like you will not get chance to suppose the next page will be hypothesis. So what will happen if you want to frame the hypothesis? You have to every time see the issues. You have to see the issues. So you have to go back to issues and again frame hypotheses. Then writing objectives also you have to see issues and hypotheses. That's why my, also I have gone to many classes and I have, most of the students prefer this stand two, model two, but I would not say model one is not good. Some of the students also use this model one. It is up to you. The sky would decide whether he's, he or she is going to use this one or this one. But sure that the scribe has to be so active that whenever they are framing hypotheses, he, he or she should show the issues to all the students immediately. Or whenever they are framing objectives, immediately he or she has to go back to issues and hypotheses so that students can remember those. So I will say, I'll go with number two, model number two, but okay. I have already told about leader. Okay, leader's role is no doubt important. He has to, or she has to lead the group. Scribe is also important, but group members are equally important. Here, group members are not less active, not passive. They are also equally active. So let us see. Definitely, first thing is you have to understand your technology. You should have the con uh, connectivity. The same thing, BBC, you have to log in before time and check BBC, how to mute, unmute, raise hand. 
you say for discipline purpose how to use chart although you you are very active you are very active very fast you know everything also some of the groups use whiteboard it's up to you if you want to learn if you want to use you can try how to use white uh, this board log on before time and edit google docs when necessary as i told you only the scribe should use the uh, google doc but in case the scribe this internet is gone in that case tutor or leader can ask someone or you can volunteer that yes i am going to write now you can write but i would suggest not all the group members should write at a time that will be a confusion who is writing what who is writing so that would be a confusion another thing is uh, now if i, I want to see uh, suppose i will see who are the participant uh, sometime i find uh, find samsung iphone i don't know who is iphone you have to write your name then i have already told you self discipline is important and particip uh, participate in both session actively uh, okay and also you need to listen and respect others ask questions actively involve research all the learning objectives we have already discussed everything share research information with others don't read from the text this is also important after the end of this session you have to give feedback to your tutor tutor yes tutor we like you the way you guide us or you prompted us we like your attitude everything whatever you want to say about your tutor also to the leader okay leader today you did an excellent job you have led the group properly to the scribe also and to other members of the group also tutor also give give feedback back to as a student as a leader as a scribe we have to give feedback to each other and tutor at the end also give feedback to you and how the problem went today you have to give feedback okay there will be, as i have told you there will be a tutor as a facilitator he or she is not going to teach you or not going to dominate the class okay uh provide provide a comfortable learning he will provide you a comfortable learning environment motivate the leaders scribe members and he will make sure that you are following all the pbl steps also i will go to your class some day uh, i will do observation that you have i have already told you that there are seven steps okay if any of the tutor will say that no no skip seven uh, step number 7 you say Dr. Sahu told that we have to follow FMS guideline, and there are seven steps, so we have to follow step number seven because that is that takes only five minutes. We have to follow that steps. Then uh, uh, promote uh, he will promote critical thinking, and whenever you uh, are any you get any pause, okay, you stop somewhere you don't know, then tutor will guide you, and he will give you feedback. these are the advantages at the end whatever you learn and you go to the pbl class and you will able to know that in pbl you you know how to learn what to learn is not important if you know how to learn you can learn and learn at any time so you in, in pbl you know how to learn you will create a new knowledge based on your previous knowledge deeply you go to learning and think critically and long term i already told you work as a team in a very friendly way and pbl because all student participate it motivates students to learn and active learning actively participate and communication skills but there are also some limitations if you not address these issues then then in pbl there will be a problem like connectivity issues you have to as a student think how to get proper connectivity they don't don't say i i lose my connectivity no no internet or some natural thing happen that you don't have control but beforehand you should have good connectivity discipline is a challenge sometime 
like some students forget to mute the mic and group talking this discipline if you not address then that is a challenge then video interaction we I, we have already discussed that whether to or whether not to appear in video and when you are interacting with video internet is slow then as you are your own student initially in first pbl or up to two pbl you may have little difficulty but i hope because the way you are participating and you, you are following me i don't think you have any problem you should have any problem then quiet student okay i'm telling you again and again don't keep quiet okay if you will not speak then that will be a problem and few students will you will find few students will definitely dominate the class that you have to avoid and late please don't come late and if you miss one class pbl class then you will miss the whole pbl so don't miss this like usually in higher education what you say attendance 75% is mandatory no here 100% attend 100 attendance should be 100% then only you can follow the pbl pro properly so let us see what are the essential thing we need for a successful good pbl connectivity self discipline knowledge of technology steps of pbl you should know um 100% attendance self directed and this commitment to self directed you all the students have to learn all the objectives then only it can be effective active participation ask question don't forget to ask when someone is presenting rest of the students have to ask question then willingness to make constructive evaluation of self means feedback feedback is important so don't forget to give feedback to your colleagues your friends and also to the tutor then share ideas and information and respect to team work so these are the essential things you have to know then only your pbl can be more successful so thank you very much so what i am going to do now i'll stop sharing and i'm going to show a video now and then if you have any challenges or difficulty you can feel you feel free to ask me i'm stopping this and sharing you a video okay this video has been made by our own students year 2 and year 3 students the pbl last for 3 hours but we try to show you in half an hour 25 minutes that how this pbl is done which is not possible in only uh, half an hour we have missed some of the steps you have to bear that but now you know the steps so you should not have any problem and i will ask you that which steps steps have been missed here you have to tell me One of the things you are going to be exposed to in medical school is problem-based learning. That's one of the main methods of instruction that we use here at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, Saint Augustine. So, to help you along, what we've decided to do is a short PBL problem-based learning demonstration video. My name is Dr. Farid Yusuf, and I will be serving as your tutor and your guide through this video. And with me I have a wonderful group of students from second and third year who have volunteered for this process. So let's get into it straight away. One of the things you will discover in your medical training is that you learn by observation. So we're going to start and as we begin we're going to explain what is happening. The problem we'll be using today is beware the Amazon. And the first thing we have to do in a PBL session is choose a leader. So students, would anybody want to be the leader for this particular session? Yeah, I'd like to volunteer as leader. Okay, excellent. At this point, we're going to hand over to the leader who will run the entire process. The first step in the process of the PBL, which consists of seven steps, 
is the identification of unfamiliar terms. Okay, so would anyone like to be volunteer to be the reader? Um, I'd volunteer. All right, uh, reader, could you please read for us line by line and anyone could pick out any unfamiliar terms you see? Okay, um, <clears throat> problem four, beware the Amazon. There are some tribes in the Amazon who dip their arrows in an extract from the plant Strychnos toxifera in order to immobilize animals when hunting. Jenna, an enthusiastic medical student, decided to test the effect of the extract on muscle contraction. She injected the extract into the limb of a frog. She noted that the extract prevented muscle contraction in response to nerve stimulation, but the muscle continued to respond when stimulated directly. In another series of experiments, the extract did not prevent the contraction of the frog's heart. So anyone see any terms? Strychnos toxifera. Can we get a definition for Strychnos toxifera? Um, I have one. Strychnos toxifera, a genus of flowering plants that is a source of arrow poison, curare, also used in fish and rodent poison. We can define muscle contraction. Okay. Muscle contraction is the activation of tension generating sites within muscle fibers. which arises as a result of the interaction between thin and thick filaments. So you will note that the students have identified two unfamiliar terms. And you will also note that as soon as they identify the unfamiliar term, they make an attempt to provide a definition. With modern technology that's available to us today, uh, no longer do we have to use a medical dictionary, but we can access these definitions uh, via the internet. Let's move on to the second step in our PBL process. So now we'll go back again to the paragraph to identify issues. Okay. Right. Rita, could you please read line by line? Yeah, sure. Um, there are some tribes in the Amazon who dip their arrows in an extract from the plant Strychnos toxifera in order to immobilize animals when hunting. Any issues there? How does Strychnos toxifera immobilize the animals? Okay, um, people do it a little differently. What extract from Strychnos toxifera? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, could you just... Oh. Um, we could change the wording to what extract from the Strychnos toxifera plant enables animals to be mobilized. Okay. And the process. I, I know. Do we want to change the, the wording of that issue a little bit? When you say the extract, what exactly are you referring to? We could say the toxin. Toxin, toxin from the plant. Needs. Or maybe the active ingredient? Yeah. 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 Could we edit it to say what is the active ingredient of strychnos toxifera okay. and how does it immobilize animals? And what mechanism I wish it immobilize the animals? Mechanisms are significant with the key. And this is actually two issues in one, so it might be better to actually just separate it for ease of understanding. Yeah. So what is the active ingredient of strychnos toxifera? And what is the mechanism of action by which it immobilizes? make one out of the difference between nerve stimulation and direct stimulation. Yeah. And why does the muscle respond? You want to read the next slide? Huh? You want to read the next slide? Yes, please. Yes, please. All right. So Jenna, an enthusiastic medical student, decided to test the effect of the extract on muscle contraction. Anything? Mm -hmm. um, you can continue. Okay. So, so no issues in that sentence there. I, I would have thought there's at least one issue. For those of you watching, the issues are questions you might ask. So you notice that the issues are being put in the form of a question. How did she prepare the extract? Okay. Anything else? We're looking for um, what is the mechanism of muscle contraction. Well, not in that particular, I didn't see that in that line. But I thought you might ask about how, how, what was the mechanism or what was the process by which she was going to test this extract. You all think you want to add that as an issue? No, I think she, in the question it's saying she, she injected. So. Yeah. Oh, so you think it will come up later? Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yes. No problem. Right. So, makes sense. She injected the extract into the limb of a frog. She noted that the extract prevented muscle contraction in response to nerve stimulation, but the muscle continued to respond when stimulated directly. Any problems? Um, 
What is the significance of injecting the extract into the limb of the frog as opposed to another body part? So I'm not a, f a big fan of the term, what is the significance? Because you could ask that for everything. So maybe you could try and phrase that um, issue a little okay, bit differently. Um, why did she inject the extract into the limb of the frog as opposed to another body part? Why do you think? I believe, well, she was probably targeting the skeletal muscle compared to injecting into the heart or injecting into um, a smooth muscle. Yeah. So when we get into the hypotheses, we'll explore that more. Yeah. We now want to move on to step three of the PBL process. Having identified the main issues in the problem, we now seek to come up with hypotheses or explanations of what's going on in the problem. Using the prior knowledge that you already have, you now seek to try and explain or give understanding to the problem. Seeking to answer the issues provides one method of coming up with the explanations for this problem. So let's look at step three. And would you like to propose any hypotheses they have? Um, yeah, I remember from the definition Trishana gave for strictness toxifera, she mentioned that the active ingredient was curare. Right. So we could use that in the first hypothesis to say curare is the active ingredient of strictness toxifera. You all agree for that? Yeah. Yes. It's important that your hypotheses are not wild guesses, but they're building upon your prior knowledge and they make good logical scientific sense. One of the issues we came up with, you'll remember students, is we wanted to know why was there a cessation of contraction from nerve stimulation, but not from direct stimulation. Would anybody like to hypothesize on that? Well, uh, as I remember from high school, it's the stimulation from the nerves responsible for causing muscle contraction. So from that, we can extrapolate that curare somehow interferes with that interaction between nerve and muscle. So a uh, possible hypothesis could be curare inhibits the conduction of uh, synaptic transmission between the nerve terminal and muscle tissue. The synaptic cleft was not the junction yet. Right. Yeah. Building upon that, what then is happening when we have direct stimulation of the muscle? The route by which the toxin works is no longer being used and as such the toxin has no effect. Right. At this point, it's not important whether your hypothesis is correct or incorrect. What's important is based on your prior knowledge, it's making logical sense. We now want to move on to stage four of the PBL process. In stage four, we now generate learning objectives, things that you, the students, feel you need to go away and study in order to better understand the problem. So let's look at stage four of the PBL process. So based on these hypotheses we have, how are we going to go about resolving them? <clears throat> I think one primary objective is, like Trishana mentioned, the different types of muscles, um, tissues, sorry, targeted in a frog limb. We could go and say, um, compare and contrast the different types of muscle tissue, mm -hmm. including, um, include cardiac, skeletal, and smooth. Okay. Makes sense. Yes. Yeah, Any other objectives? Well, based on what we just discussed with the different types of stimulation, we could uh, explain the difference between direct stimulation and nerve stimulation. You think that's a, that's, that's, you can do some research on that, but is there a better way of getting up, of phrasing what we're going after then as a learning objective? Is it the types of synaptic transmission? Describe the mechanism of synaptic transmission. That, that might be a bit better. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? We should also include um, the sites at which transmission can be blocked. Like you mentioned, QRA before, so we should know exactly where it's acting. So, the anatomy of a synaptic. Left. 
scaling mechanism of axonal synaptic cleft. So I'm not really there. Oh, yeah, synaptic transmission. Yeah, that, yeah, that will include the anatomy. Yeah. Are, you, are you sure that when you do the mechanism of action, okay. you'll also remember to do the structure mm -hmm. of the synapse? Or do we want a separate <laughs> objective for that? Yeah, I think, think we should separate it. Yeah, I think yeah, we yeah. should separate it because... To make sure we don't miss out anything. They're similar, but they're also distinct in their own right. So dis um, discuss the structure of the synaptic lab. In the synaptic cleft, we could be more specific and say neuromuscular junction. Yeah. Would that include these sites at which um, synaptic transmission can be hindered or blocked? Yes, it will. Yeah. 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 Well, well, I might think that that's a separate objective. Entirely. Mm -hmm. And this one. Do you have think we should do? Well, yeah, I thought we were going to go ahead with that objective, the separate one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sites. Yeah. Maybe, Minakshi, we could add in what agents block it and in that objective discuss where the agents would block. Yeah, that does yeah. better. So, list. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what, oh, yeah, the priest. Um, list the site, um, list the agents on site that if synaptic transmission can be hindered or blocked. What you specific mention to Glory? Well, well be we could still list the compounds and toxins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That hinder synaptic. And the sites of action. Yeah. So from your from this process, you can see we'll generate quite a good list of learning objectives. For any one problem, you might uh, generate between six to ten learning objectives. And so this process from steps one to four concludes what we call the brainstorming part of the PBL process. Let me just recap for you. The brainstorming part consists of uh, getting together and getting to know your group, reading the problem, and then step one is the identification and clarification of unfamiliar terms. Step two is going through the problem to identify what you think are the critical issues in the problem. Step three is the generation of hypotheses or explanations based upon your current knowledge. And finally, step four is the generation of learning objectives. At this point, the PBL session will end for the day. And now the students will retire and spend the next week studying and researching the learning objectives. When we gather again in a week's time, we will now discuss the learning objectives and seek to provide better understanding of what's taking place in the problem. Welcome back. It's a week later and we want to continue our journey through PBL. Just to remind you, PBL is a learning process that we use here at the Faculty of Medical Science. For medical sciences. Following the process is very, very important. It's not something that you should abort. So last week, or a few minutes ago, you saw the first steps of the process. Over the past week, uh, the students have been working very hard. They have been checking their books. They have been doing research on the internet. And now we're able to, having completed step five, self-directed learning, begin step six, problem resolution and knowledge consolidation. So let me hand over to the leader of the group once again. Okay, so just to recap, so we're all familiar, can the reader please reread the entire paragraph? Sure. Um, problem four, beware the Amazon. <coughs> there are some tribes in Amazon who dip their arrows in an extract from the plant Strychnos toxifera in order to immobilize animals when hunting. Jenna, an enthusiastic medical student, decided to test the effect of the extract on muscle contraction. She injected the extract into the limb of a frog. She noted that the extract prevented muscle contraction in response to nerve stimulation, but the muscle continued to respond when stimulated directly. In another series of experiments, the extract did not prevent contraction of the frog's heart. All right, so now we'll go on to present what we discovered in our research. Um, who would like to present this? Okay, I would present the first objective. All right. 
So to reread, compare and contrast the different types of muscle tissue. So I have some diagrams here that we can use as a guideline. So first we have the cardiac muscle. So as you can see from the diagram, the cardiac muscle has striations. There is also intercalated discs at the adjoining fibers and the nucleus is centrally placed. The nucleus, the, the tissue fiber itself is, is either mononucleated or it could sometimes be binucleated. So, as you can see by the name cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle is found in the heart. So it aids in the pumping of blood. To move on to another type of muscle, we have the skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscle is also striated in appearance. However, you can see that the nucleus is peripherally located. There's also multinucleation happening here. As you can see, it forms a triad complex as opposed to the cardiac, which forms a dyad complex. And skeletal muscle, by the means, as you can see, is found along the bones and aids in movements as well. Then we have another classification, the smooth muscle. So smooth muscle, the development is poor. And it's also mononucleated and it's placed centrally. With smooth muscle, it is widely distributed in the internal organs. Anybody has anything they'd like to add in? To this, smooth muscle is also involuntary. Cardiac muscle is also involuntary. Um, skeletal muscle is voluntary. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very good. Well, let me just ask one or two questions. You mentioned the term striations. What, what exactly do we mean by striations? Anybody can answer. So, so, based on the research that I found, with any muscle, there are different types of bands. So we have some light bands, we have some dark bands, and it's because of how these light and dark bands alternate, it gives the appearance of lines that what we call striations in the muscle fibers. Excellent, excellent. Basically, the overlapping of thin and thin and thick fibers. Yes. Yes. Therefore, you can just tell one type of muscle from another simply by looking at it under a microscope. True. Another thing I thought you might have asked, but maybe you know already, so you forgive me if I don't know. You mentioned the term triads. What exactly is a triad? A uh, triad is a feature of the sarcoma, like all cell, or, well, muscle tissues made up of cells. And like all cells, they have a cell membrane. The cell membrane of a muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. And it's a distinguishing feature of skeletal muscle is the sarcolemma in invaginates into the cell. And that invagination forms like three fingers, and that's why it's referred to as a triad. This, fo this um, formation is essential in muscle contraction. Excellent. Very good. So as you can see, the students will now go through a process of discussion, presentation, questioning one another in order to expose and uh, share their understanding of their week's research. At the end of going through all the learning objectives, the students should have a very, very good understanding of what is actually taking place inside of this particular problem. What they will now be required to do is to go back over their explanations or the hypotheses that they generated and see if the hypotheses are actually correct. Remember when they first did this a week ago, it was based on prior knowledge. But now they've spent a week studying, they can tell whether their explanation is correct or not. If it is incorrect, they're required to rewrite the hypothesis correctly based on what they have learned. At the end of the entire process, they now should be able to explain the problem. And that's step seven, which you'll see in your PBL manual. In step seven, they want to apply their new knowledge to the problem. So I'm going to ask the leader to take us through step seven. Okay. So now after we did a week's research, right, just to ensure that we completely understand the problem at hand, back through it and describe each step, each part of it. Right? So Rita, you can take us through uh, line by line. Yeah, sure. All right. So um, step seven, we have to there are some tribes in Amazon who dip their arrows in an extract from the 
plant strychnos toxiferin in order to immobilize animals when hunting. Jenna, an enthusiastic medical student, injected the extract into the limb of a frog. She noted that the extract prevented muscle contraction in response to nerve stimulation, but the muscle continued to respond when stimulated directly. In another series of experiments, the extract did not prevent contraction of the frog's heart. So in the first line, anybody would like to offer up um, their conclusions on that? Well, from our research, we found out that the extract was curare, right. and it immobilized the animals by preventing synaptic transmission. So therefore, no muscle contraction. So, it's important that now you're in medical school, you use correct language. So the extract here contains the active ingredient strychnos. Well, the extract is from the plant strychnos toxifera. But the extract itself is in curare. What really is curare? We used it previously last week. What's a better term to describe curare? The toxin. The toxin or maybe the active ingredient. Very good. Um, uh, let me, oh, go ahead. And also a bit of peripheral information, right? I also discovered through research. We also brought up the issue of why did Jenna inject it into the frog's legs? The interesting thing about the toxin curare, right, is if it's ingested orally, it has no effect. Right? It needs to be received either intramuscularly or intravenously to be effective. So that would be the reason for the Amazonians dipping their arrows into it, and that would also be the reason why Jenna had to inject it. I think to also to add to what John was saying, um, in more depth, the curare, the toxin, it usually binds to the nicotinic receptors on the postsynaptic membrane and competitively and reversibly um, inhibits acetylcholine. And that's why we don't have any generation of action potential postsynaptic. So no muscle contraction. Yeah. yeah. And also, curare affected animals, right? The curare toxin is broken up by the cooking process, so it does not alter the taste, nor is it poisonous to anybody who ingests an animal who has been hunted with curare. So you can see, just by looking at that one line, how the students this week know a lot more than they did last week. And as we go through this line by line, you see the students have gained a wealth of knowledge. One of the things that's important about the PBL process is you, the student, now take responsibility for your learning. And as you saw in the discussion, different people went and did some extra research on curare and its effects. So that completes the PBL process, steps one through step seven. What we want to do now is just spend a couple minutes getting some feedback from the students of how they enjoyed the process did they think it worked? What was particularly interesting about this problem? So I'll begin by saying, students, I think you, you think you did a good job. Uh, you seemed to work well together as a team, and the leader was doing a good job. Uh, as far as this particular problem uh, was concerned, uh, did you find the problem useful? Yes, I did. Um, the problem addressed a lot of the topics that we covered in school. And with using an active or live example of the toxin curare, we were able to identify how it inhibits muscle contraction and also how muscle contraction occurs without inhibi inhibition or without toxins. Okay. Uh, did, was there anything particularly challenging about this problem for you? No. No, there was not. No, not really. No. If you had to make any suggestions uh, about the problem going forward, would you? Have anything in particular you wanted to say? Mm. No, I guess the problem was well suited to our syllabus, and it was it was interesting to learn, and it wasn't very hard to grasp the information. Finally, any comments? Uh, were you happy with the leader and the scribe? Yes, we were. Very much. Yes. So. <laughs> your opportunity very to much say. So. <laughs> very much so. The reason we give this feedback is PBL is not just a process of learning, it also allows you to develop other skills. You can develop leadership skills, communication skills, and also your ability to summarize and collate information. So at the end of a uh, program involved in PBL, you should not just be very knowledgeable, but you should have the capacity to lead others and also be a very, very good communicator. Hello, my name is Dr. Fareed Youssef. I'm a senior lecturer in the physiology unit of the Department of Preclinical Sciences 
and I've been serving as a PBL tutor for over 15 years. Hi, my name is Rajiv Singh. I'm a second year medical student. Hi, I'm Anakshi Mohan. I'm a third year medical student. Hi, my name is Amrika Rohan. I'm a second year medical student. Hi, my name is Randal Ramjit Singh and I'm a year two medical student. Good day, my name is Saeed Mohammed and I'm a second year medical student. Hi, my name is John Mohammed and I'm a third year medical student. Hi, my name is Roshana Gopi and I'm a third year medical student. So that then brings us to the end of our PBL video demonstration. I hope now there's rapturous applause in the audience for our <laughs> students. <laughs>
but uh, it is the responsibility of the leader and also the tutor that any student not participating or any student dominating the class at that time, they have to manage the PBL properly. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you for joining me and thank you very much for your presence and I wish you all the uh, best for your first year classes, yeah, online classes, PBL classes. I hope you, will, you are going to enjoy. Thank you very much and over to Rihanna, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sahu, for that presentation. I'm looking at our chat again, and we have only positive comments. I do not see any more questions relating to PBL. This is your opportunity here. I know someone asked about the groups. So to explain how the groups work, the Office of the Deputy Dean, Basic Health Sciences, we are responsible. I'm also the administrative assistant to the deputy dean for basic health sciences. And we are responsible for the groupings, right? The groupings are done at random assignment. You cannot choose your group that you wish to be in. You cannot choose your tutor. If you do have problems with your group, you can feel free to email the deputy dean, perhaps for an appointment or a meeting. However, please note that, you know, the switching of groups, it is not usually granted unless it's an emergency, if there's a family conflict, stuff like that, right? Um, just a, a show in the chat, what programs are you guys in? Let's see, let's see. Those we have this morning with us, the MBBS students, the vet students, dental students, and pharmacy students. So what I want you guys to do as well, I'm seeing, okay, so we have some vet, dental, we have our nice mix here. I'm seeing pharmacy, lovely. So what I would like to do is after our orientation has, has been completed this week, you guys are required to nominate your group representatives, right? The representative for year one in your subject. Once you all have your arrangements to know who that representative is, is I would appreciate if you can just send me an email, let me know who that person is. Of course, you all are supposed to have my email address. It's rihanna.ramutasing at sta.uwi.edu. I'm sending it back in the chat. Miss, excuse, can you please elaborate as to the uh, various responsibilities of the representatives? Um, usually that's determined within the student body. So for example, I can't really go into much detail because the students are the one that organize the groupings and how their organizations are run. Um, the Veterinary Student Association, the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Student Association. We do have on our program a representative on Thursday from the Medical Sciences Student Council president. Um, she's a guild president for the faculty. Her name is Melissa Jack. She can elaborate more as to how these groupings would work and, um, you know, to select the representative of, of your um, school and all of that, right? So all I'm asking is you guys keep me in the loop so that if it is I have to email you, for example, for PBL, if I have to send you the, you know, the document of the groupings, I can send it to the, the rep and then the rep can help distribute it to the rest of the class, right? I don't know if that answers your question, but hopefully Melissa Jack can answer more on Thursday. Thank you. Sure. Right. I would now like to take this opportunity to introduce our next guest speaker on our program, Dr. Sarah Chinyanki, who is a clinical psychologist over at CAPS, which is the Counseling and Psychology um, Division over at UE. Dr. Sarah, are you with us this morning? Good. Hi, yeah, morning. Hi, welcome to our orientation for our year one students. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I sorry know, I missed I the session on, on PBL. It sounded exciting. It was very interesting <laughs> and informative. So I now hand over to you. All right. So just to say a welcome to everybody. I know we're going to spend a few minutes um, thinking a little bit about stress management and relaxation. Um, I would have thought since you spent the whole morning on PBL, you might need a little relaxation. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a little uh, relaxation exercise, okay? So I'm going to ask you uh, whether you are, well, I'm sure nobody's lying down, so I'm sure you're all sitting up. I'm going to ask you just to get into a comfortable position where your back is straight but not rigid. Um, and you can actually close your eyes for this one if you like. Um, and we're just going to take a few minutes to try a little relaxation, what we call progressive muscle relaxation, okay? So I want you to start by taking a nice deep breath through your nose. And as you let that breath out through your nose, just gently close your eyes. And I want you to bring your attention to your breath. So you're gonna continue breathing in through your nose and out through your nose. And you don't need to slow it down. You don't need to breathe extra deeply. You're just gonna follow your natural breath in through your nose and out through your nose. And you're gonna follow the whole length of your in-breath and follow the whole length of your out-breath. Maybe noticing the little pause between your exhalation and your next inhalation. And you might find that you're distracted. Maybe you're thinking about what you just ate or what you're going to eat, or you're thinking about what you learned this morning or what you have ahead of you. And that's okay. Just notice what occupied your mind and then bring your attention gently back to your breath. So now I'm going to ask you to bring your attention to your face, to the muscles in your forehead and the muscles behind your eyebrows and around your eyes. And I want you to bring your attention to your eyelids and how delicate those eyelids are, but the important job that they do. And on your next out breath, I want you to relax the muscles in your forehead. Relax all the little muscles around your eyes and the tops of your cheeks. And just really soften your forehead, relax your eyes. And I want your attention to run down to your jawline and the sides of your neck all the way out to the tips of your shoulders. And again, on your next out breath, Notice any tension or tightness and just gently let that tension leak out in your out breath, dropping your shoulders slightly, relaxing the muscles in your neck and relaxing the muscles in your jaw. Now we're gonna take three breaths that are a little bit slower than usual. You're going to breathe into the count of three you're going to hold that breath for the count of two, and then you're going to exhale to the count of five. So in your own time, counting in your head, breathe in to the count of three, hold for the count of two, and breathe out to the count of five. And just repeat that two more times. And as you let go of the deep breathing, just let your breath naturally go back to its own rhythm. Okay, so open your eyes, ground yourself back in your room. And that's just a tiny little exercise just to help you try and be more mindful, I guess, of your breath and of your body. And for those of us that hold a lot of tension in our back, our shoulders, frowning, our faces, whatever it may be, it actually just gives you a little exercise to really focus and actually intentionally and purposefully relax your muscles and using your breath to help you do that, okay? So 
that's one little exercise here and this dog gently demonstrates that but the other thing I want to kind of really highlight today is the importance of checking in with yourself so while you want to be on top of your work I'm sure you're all very motivated and ready to go with your academics and your semester ahead I'm actually going to really encourage you to stay on top of how you are feeling so this very sophisticated emotional check-in visual uh, is really just about you finding what's my mood like am I feeling motivated am I looking forward to the day did I wake up with a sense of dread and then ask yourself what might I be dreading what might I be looking forward to what is exciting and what might I find boring and so there's something about actually checking in with your mood on a regular basis and that's not something that a lot of us are very um, good at um, we may have about seven different hair products we hopefully brush our teeth at least twice a day. And those are regular things that we don't negotiate. But the question might be, how do I make a little time to actually check in with my mood and how I'm doing, right? Because the, your mood essentially shapes your perspective, influences your ability to concentrate, and by extension, remember the material that you're trying to learn. So when you think about being a good student um, and doing your absolute best for your work, part of that is taking care of yourself otherwise you all will know by now when you're stressed when you're feeling low mood when you're feeling irritable these things can affect your appetite your sleep and your ability to focus your ability to want to engage with people for example and it has huge impact on your motivation so in theory you're geared up to do your best but if you're feeling very low and emotionally burnt out and mentally exhausted, you're not going to have a lot of motivation to put in those extra hours. So when you're taking time to do a little relaxation, this isn't a waste of time. This is actually an investment in your well-being so you can actually do your work even better. So one of the things that we really need to think about um, while we're thinking about starting your program, we're really starting it in the midst of COVID. Um, and there's not one person that has not been affected by COVID to some extent. Unfortunately, some of us have actually lost people due to COVID. Some of us have been ill. Some of us have been very worried about being ill. Some of us are maybe in a little denial. It'll never happen to us. But even if you are in extreme impressive denial, um, one thing that has changed is our whole social, a whole social landscape. And a lot of you obviously will be starting university in a very different way than you imagined. So I do want you to kind of take a little check in at some point in terms of how has COVID affected me very individually, very personally, because everybody has had a little extra stress and a little extra what we call chronic trauma. So I beg you to remember trauma is not a big thing that happens only in soap operas and national disasters and tsunamis and things. Trauma can actually be what we call trauma with a small T. Lots of little things that have cut you off from your regular supports, maybe your regular exercise, maybe liming and interaction was your major stress reliever, and that's been seriously cut. Um, you might have not maybe been so close to some of your friends and family in the last year or two, and that may have affected you. Some of you are actually with your family a lot more than usual, and that may be supportive, but that may also be very unsupportive and very stressful. So it kind of goes both ways. So COVID has really changed our lives um, for the time being. I think this is one of the key, key things we need to think about when we think about stress management, that a lot of us are very ambitious, hardworking people. Maybe you've got you that kind of person with your head on your shoulders and you always have a plan. Maybe you always have two or three backup plans. But the thing with stress management is that plans don't always go to plan. And one of your key strategic moves for stress management is actually being able to adapt and sometimes it's not just adapt once, huh? it's actually adapting constantly when the situation demands it. Because if we hold on too tightly to our first five plans and none of them are working, this is what often contributes to a lot of distress or maybe even a feeling like I'm failing at this, I'm not doing well because I'm not on top of it. So adaptation can be stressful because you're not always going to feel confident. But the bottom line is, can I can I change things around to try and adapt and make the best of what might actually be a really yucky situation, right? 
First, you actually need to know yourself. Take a minute, have a look at this, decide where do you sit at this table? So we're all very different. Some of us may be very optimistic. Some of us may be very pessimistic. Most of us fall somewhere in between. Often you will notice that your mood determines your perspective a lot of the time. And this is pretty normal, but the key thing is actually knowing what you're like. Where do you naturally sit? And knowing that will help you have a little balance when your mood and your perspective are kind of getting maybe a little carried away, right? So the first thing I want you to think about is a little irreverence actually about the way you think. Because if you're naturally a bit of a pessimist, or if you naturally tend to be, you know, your moods kind of can go up and maybe very low sometimes, then your mood and your thinking are very intertwined. So if I'm feeling disappointed, a little unsure of myself, I may be much more likely to think, you know, whatever, my, my group project, my presentation is not going to go well. You know, I'm more likely to think, oh, I'm not good at this. I'll probably make a mistake. Everyone will think, I don't know what I'm talking about. It'll be the worst. My consultant will hate me, whatever it may be. In other words, your mood is very much shaping the way you anticipate something happening. It can also shape the way you reflect on something. So if you have felt very anxious about something or maybe you're feeling very low, you're more likely to think that you messed something up just now or more likely to be convinced it didn't go well. Even when people say, hey, like, great job. You did that really well. We may be more likely to dismiss it. So you understand what I'm saying? It's real important to understand the way that you tend to look at things and also what your mood is like, because you can then consider your evaluations in, in the context of that, right? I think this is another one that really hits home in a way that I, I like to really keep this in my mind. There are a lot of things that matter and a whole lot more that actually don't matter. And what I realize as a therapist and working with people is that sometimes when we get very panicked, when we get very anxious, we tend to really focus on a whole bunch of rubbish that in the big scheme of things actually doesn't matter. And sometimes we do that because we fuss about all the little things that we think we can control to get a sense that, you know, as we say in this thing, I'm in control. But sometimes we take control of the teeny tiny things that, that really don't matter at all. Sometimes, you know, I try and think in five years from now, how important would this be for me? How influential will this be in my life? You know, two weeks from now even, or this time next year. So determining what matters to you and what doesn't is actually a key thing to think about in terms of your energies when you put through, especially when, if you're not already, when you are exhausted and depleted and really kind of fed up, you're not going to have a whole lot of energy and you need to be very strategic where you place that. Another reality check is what you have control over. If you do have control over, fantastic. Congratulations. You can then think about problem solving, right? How do I want to address this? But the bottom line is there's so much that we do not have control of. If you didn't think this before, surely you haven't made it through 18 months of COVID without this realization, right? So um, UE, a wonderful place to study, but let's think about it. There are a lot of things that are decided, sometimes changed at the last minute, not always communicated in the best way that you would like that are outside of your control. And a lot of stress management is having a game plan for the things that you can't fix. So I want to introduce or reinforce for some of you that concept of mindfulness. And I want you to imagine a stormy ocean. Weather's pretty stormy out there, so this won't be difficult. Now, for those of you that can't swim, please don't panic. Pretend you are in a nice air-conditioned, super sealed submarine with loads of oxygen, okay? If you are on the surface of that ocean, the waves are buffeting you about, there's flashes of lightning, there's like huge roars of thunder, right? Maybe that's happening where you are right now. I hope it isn't, but if it is. Now imagine you sink below the waves a little bit. Now your, your submarine is still being buffeted around, but you can't hear the thunder as much, but you can see the lightning. Imagine sinking further again, just slowly, slowly, just under the waves, under the waves. Eventually you get to a depth where there's a very gentle undulation of current. Maybe you actually can't see the lightning anymore. Maybe it's actually quite dark 
And all that you can see is the beautiful, calming blue light of your submarine, right? Um, and also you can't hear anything except the lovely piped music in your submarine, okay? Maybe it's Barry Manilow, who knows? Oh, that's not, that's not calming. But the point is, is that this is you taking some distance away from the storm. The storm has not stopped. It is still crashing the waves. There are still peals of thunder and, and, and fork lightning everywhere. But where you are, at the depth where you are, you've actually carved out a little comfort for yourself, a little distance, if you will. You can't stop the storm, but you can take a little step back, right? Oh my goodness, I'm seeing people are feeling a bit calm already and I'm talking about storms. This is very positive. So mindfulness is actually a strategy that helps you take a little break from the storm that is going on in your life, right? So I'm making it sound sophisticated, but it really isn't. There's three things. It's about being present, paying attention. It's not staring out, the out your window with like nothing on your mind. You're actually thinking about what's happening, how your body's feeling, what your mind is on. Maybe you're following your breath in this moment, whatever it is, whatever you use, you're paying attention and you're doing it in the now. You're not thinking about what you heard in PBL this morning. You're not thinking about what's next. You're just thinking in this moment, how this chair feels underneath me, whatever it may be. And the last bit, which is actually kind of critical, is you're doing that non-judgmentally. And I'm going to give you a tiny example. So I'm a therapist, right? Now imagine I get super irritated and I'm just pissed off, right? And then I think, oh God, I'm so annoyed and angry. So I'm mindful, I'm attentive, but I might think, come on, Sarah, you're a psychologist. You know, you should, you should have this. You should be more zen. You shouldn't be so... Um, irritated or impatient or whatever it may be. Now, this is where I need to be able to be a bit more non-judgmental and kind of say, listen, the situation is frustrating. And so this is no wonder I'm feeling a bit irritated right now. In other words, I'm human, right? And so that non-judgmental part is actually very important for the stress management because it's about accepting what's happening in this moment, even if it's a horrible moment and it's very unpleasant, right? You can do this while you are waiting for your KFC. God forbid you're eating KFC, but I know you all are anyway. So let's work with the uh, reality of it. It may well be that you get your bucket delivered. Delicious. When you open that bucket or that snack box, it may just be about taking a moment to close your eyes and taking a whiff and go, mmm, this lovely fried old oil smell, delicious. And just maybe noticing your mouth watering. Then you look at your bucket or your snack box. You look at the fries, you look at the coleslaw, you look at whatever, the chicken, and then actually just take a moment to think, how pleasant is this? What am I looking forward to eating the most, <laughs> right? And even when you take your first, your first bite, like how juicy, delicious, hot, oh my God, I've just burnt my tongue, whatever it may be, it really is focusing on that first bite and that, that experience of enjoying your, your cholesterol in a box, right? Mm, God, I'm feeling hungry. Okay. Now, let's just think a little bit about um, physical, right? <laughs> your mood and your gut bacteria. There's so much research now in terms of the health of your gut bacteria, right? Actually influencing our moods to the point where they want to have, you know, like probiotics that are actually going to help our mood. Fascinating. Let's see how this goes. But what does that mean for us? Sometimes when we get anxious or stressed or fed up or whatever it may be, uh, we tend to skip meals, we're not hungry, we feel nauseous, Ugh, the thought of eating it, unless it's KFC, puts us off. Now, some of you like to do this, you know, sophisticated fasting and things like that. Mm, I already know about that. My point is, is that if it is that you're finding it difficult to eat because of stress and so on, and you're not doing a systematic strategic fasting, your blood sugar just goes to the toilet. And if you ate like yesterday afternoon, you get up, you live on coffee, you don't have breakfast, you don't eat until two or three the next afternoon, your blood sugar is just terrible. And that can actually impact your attention and your ability to focus and remember. And so if it is you're doing strategic fasting with your nutritionist, okay, that's none of my business. But if it is that you're having trouble eating and you notice it affects your mood or it affects your ability to focus, then this is something that we need to really think about because it may well be that you need to think creatively about what snacks you have that aren't gonna make you throw up. 
or some meal supplement drinks on those days when you need to get going in the morning and you need to really be on for your lectures, but you can't eat anything really. You can't eat food, food in the morning, right? Because coffee is not a food. It is life, <laughs> but it's not a food, okay? So the other thing again is the snacking. When I talked about snacking, I didn't mean um, tiramisu miniatures, right? Uh, because often when we're stressed, we do actually crave sugar and we do crave those carbs. That's what the body does when it's under stress. And that's fine. I am saying don't enjoy a Kit Kat. I'm saying be mindful of what you're eating and how much of it you're eating, right? Um, so because that again, if you, you know, if, you, if you're going on sugar and lovely white bread and, and, and uh, I was going to say chips, fries, remember, you could get a bit of a crash later on, right? So we want to just be a little bit mindful of how we, we, we snack, yes, on the yummy things, but also have enough going on in between, okay? Staying hydrated sounds really simple, but we all know the world is burning up and we're probably all going to die. But in the meantime, we are responsible for hydrating as much as we can because dehydration can actually affect your concentration, okay? So just make sure, especially as you're home, for most of you online, you may not actually notice, yes, Natalia, grab that water indeed. We may not notice how hot it is all the time. So make sure that you do actually fill a flask. And so, you know, by lunchtime, it's like, have you gotten halfway through? If not, you know, kind of push it a little bit, right? Now, I'm not saying you fill your flask with um, flavored vodka, people. We're talking about water, coconut water, um, you know, even flavored waters, if you don't love water, right? Um, decaffeinated teas might be nice. Um, and if, you, if you're hitting the juice, then maybe you want to dilute it a bit or have... Uh, what do I want to say? Water, coconut water in between because juice has a lot of sugar in it as well. Or for some of us who are bothered by acid, obviously you don't want too much of that, right? Okay. Um, Y'all know the science to this. Serotonin, dopamine, and a host of other things. These really are the neurotransmitters that are most connected to mood. And ways that we actually can help boost these things is making time for exercise. It was this massive study that gave people antidepressants and some got no antidepressants. They were gypped, but they were made to exercise for at least 30 minutes, um, about three or four times a week. And what we found, not we, I didn't do it. What was found was that people with mild to moderate symptoms of depression actually enjoy the same boost as those that had been on antidepressants for a few weeks, right? Now, I'm not talking about going up the four stairs to your living room and counting that. Huh? Don't congratulate yourself because you took the stairs once a day. I'm talking about exercise that actually has you a little bit out of breath, right? So not about to have a heart attack, but, you know, kind of breathing heavy, <laughs> like a pervy call. But the point is, is that you really want to kind of get moving. Um, and when you're feeling fed up, come on, people, imagine your worst day ever, you were fed up. You don't even know what the point is anymore. Right? That's not when you want to put on your spandex and do a high intensity interval workout on off YouTube. Okay, so you want to start off with something that's doable. Don't set your sights on. Yes, this Chinese woman said it, I'm going to exercise four times a week. You're going to think, how do I build in stuff gradually? Because when you have exams going on, you know, or you say, well, I don't have time to um, exercise. I don't even have time to eat. But this is when you actually need that break to do something physical and have a proper snack to keep your brain going. Okay, so your time management really is crucial. And actually investing in doing these things for yourself. They're not a luxury. It's actually to keep yourselves going. You're only in year one, people. Wait till I meet you in counseling in year three and four when you're broken human beings, right? Let's try and avoid that. Okay. Our families don't look like this, right? Some of you are actually stuck at home. And I'm going to be honest. If you have wonderful, healthy families that are like really supportive and so proud of you no matter what you do, that's wonderful. I'm real happy for you. But for some of us, actually, we don't have that. And for some of us, unfortunately, families can actually be quite a toxic place. So we have to be mindful moving forward, you know, with all the hard work and all the things we want to do for ourselves, what is the space that we're in, right? Do I have the relationships around me that I'd like? If I don't, you know what? Sometimes you just have to work with where you are. Um, but how do I carve out some space? Maybe I need to think about if there are any other healthier boundaries that I can put in place, either to protect myself, 
protect my confidence, protect my work. Um, and, you know, if it is a really difficult, toxic environment at home and you don't have the option to like move out, right? <laughs> that would be nice. But um, then you need to think that I need to take care, better care of myself because this is a tough environment. So what could I possibly do to step up my self-care? Okay. Now, on that note, I'm going to be asking you shortly in about 13 minutes, what's one thing you're going to do for yourself to improve your stress management? So I hope you're thinking, right? Making some notes there. All right. Social media. Love it. Hate it. It's one way of keeping in touch, especially when we haven't been so long without seeing people face to face. I know that's opening up now, um, but social media is important. But unfortunately, it can also be a way that we just spread the most negative, crappy energy. So please be mindful what you spend time on. Be mindful what you share with others as well. And of course, there's an app for everything. For those of you that do want to try something new for yourself, there are apps like Calm, Headspace that take you through very nice relaxing exercises like the one I just started off with you. Um, and also things like Calm also have these sleep stories so that for those of you that have trouble sleeping, you can put these on. I've never reached the end of it. But I'm telling you, these sneaky bastards, there is one you do um, subscribe and pay money. So the free version has very limited stuff. But it's important that you check things out and see, um, you know, what you like the sound of. There's another one called Mindful that actually gives you little reminders during the day to take a breath. There's another one called I Breathe that does the same. And these ones are free um, and may just kind of help remind you to take a moment. All right. There's another one called Healthy Minds that actually encourages you to think about all kinds of different things in terms of how socially connected you feel in any moment and, and so on. Oh, I see someone's also mentioned Luminosity Mind is great too. So lots of things that you can check out um, when you are relaxing or sitting on the toilet or whatever it may be, right? Now, of course, if you are too attached to your phone, like you're sitting on the toilet on your phone, um, I'm sure, yes, there are apps to help you with that as well. You can actually make sure you switch off your screen time at a certain time to help, um, help your sleep, okay? All right, so time management. I'm sure you all are all great time managers, but let's face it, psychological, mood-related things can make some of us want to avoid and procrastinate like professional procrastinators. And so you need to think where you are, what you're great at, what you're not so great at. Maybe you need a structured um, schedule. Now that we're online, you know what? Maybe you need to reach out to your classmates and say, listen, you know, we could maybe put something together where we meet once a week to go over stuff. And then that kind of structure where you have a bit of peer support, a bit of positive peer pressure might actually help you carve out that time and stick with it, right? So all of those things you kind of need to think a little bit about what will help you moving forward and actually to get going soon. And it would be a wonderful way to kind of interact with each other out of class and get some relationship going because, you know, you're going to be stuck with each other for at least the next five years. Might as well try and make it as pleasant as possible. So this takes us to our nice social networking, whether you are an introvert, an extrovert, whether you love social media, whether you're not on anything but WhatsApp, it really doesn't matter. When it comes to your mental health and your well-being, how you see yourself in relation to the world and people actually becomes quite critical, whether you have one friend on Facebook or 75,000 people, right? I'm not on Facebook. I don't actually know how it works, but it sounds like a lot. Um, and so it's important to think about who you connect with, whether it's one person that you might call, right? Whether there's one person in your life that you can actually message and say, I feel like crap. Do you have five minutes to talk? Because if you're putting on a brave face for everybody that you talk to, um, then that's not the same as social support. So there's something about doing a little clear through in your mind about who you feel a bit more open to be, be yourself with. And for the, everybody else that you kind of put on a little front for, now is the time to have a think about it. It's very important that you keep an eye on other people, okay? Because in this day and age, when we're texting and messaging and you're like, hey, how are you going? Yeah, I'm good. You? Are you really good? Or are you just hoping that nobody asks you a second time? If you haven't heard back from somebody, before you say, you see, God, nobody loves me. I always chase down people. You could send a second text maybe they're in trouble actually but they're not likely to say unless they know 
that you're genuinely interested. So when you're asking someone, boy, how are you really doing? Make sure that you're ready for an answer um, and be prepared to question it perhaps, you know, because we really do need to kind of keep an eye out on each other these days, right? We're so isolated. All right, this is just um, a snapshot from the counseling service webpage. So um, as, you, as we said in the beginning, the counseling service falls under the Division of Student Services and Development, or DSSD. So we're on the main webpage, obviously. You look for CAPS. Um, you can actually click appointments with a counselor that will give you a little uh, form. You just fill it out. Well, here's my name, first time, coming back, whatever, whatever. That generates an email to us, um, and we'll get you registered. And then have, we have everything's online, so you have an online appointment. We have virtual walk-ins every Thursday afternoon between 1 and 4. Now, you can't book that, right? That's why it's called a virtual walk-in. The registration will open up every Thursday at nine o'clock. So you go online, you click on it, you register, and then you'll get um, a, a slot. Now, this is more like an emergency slot. You know, you have something that's pretty urgent. You can't wait for an appointment. It gives you 20, 30 minutes with a counselor to really kind of deal with something. Safe Space is a weekly student group. Whether you are a member or an ally of the LGBT community. This is where we talk about sex, sexuality, gender orientation, gender expression, stress, life, UE, whatever, right? We have obviously virtual weekly sessions. We have an open day coming up on Friday, the 17th of September from five to six. And if you want any information on Safe Space, either go on the web space, website, web space, go on the website, click on it, you'll see it, or just send me an email at safespaceuwi at gmail.com, right? Mindful Mondays, that's there. Every Monday we have an hour of relaxation, okay? And you have our email there, counselor at sta.uwi.edu. So just to give you a little idea of some of the online services, okay? October is Mental Health Month, people. So look out for events that we are having. Okay, so... Gentle reminder, I don't know what you have on on Mondays from five to six, whatever it is, it can't be more important than Mindful Mondays. So you can check that out. Oh, so he's asking about the website. I Just give me a minute. I will put it in the chat as soon as I finish this actually, then you could just check it out from there. Mind the Gap is a co-curricular course. Many of you are not gonna have a lot of time, but I do have some FMS students who actually sign up for this. Again, it's, it's, it's on the web. If you look under the co-curricular program, this is about mental health, active listening skills, why we think about self-harm and suicide as much as we do, why do people get depressed? Why do people stay in abusive relationships? And it really is about understanding yourself and others and really some practical helping skills in, in supporting you know, other people in your life. If you, if, when you successfully pass this co-curricular course, which is a credit, um, you can actually become a UE Peer Counselor. And the UE Peer Counseling Association is online under the Guild. It's a student association. So you can check that out. If you're the type of person everyone always comes to for support, this might actually be interesting for you, okay? Now, I want you to think a little bit about if there's one thing um, that you think you need to go back and start doing again, or something you heard today that's actually given you an idea of what you would like to try, please think about one thing that you would like to add to your repertoire of taking care of yourself this semester. And I would really invite you, if you're feeling very brave, and you know, put it in the chat, or you can send it to me privately if you like, but if you put it in the chat, then everyone can see these great ideas. So I would love it if you wanna take a minute and do that. And while you're doing that, if anyone had any questions or comments, now might be the time. I think we have about four more minutes. I could do a very brief meditation or maybe we just wanna open for, for questions, I'm not sure. So I've, I've just stopped the slides for a bit just to make sure, see if there are any questions you'll wanna, oh, the website, I'll find the website for you in the meantime. Any questions, guys? So we're not seeing any questions at this point. I do see someone asking for a um, meditation. A meditation, right. So mm -hmm. here is, oops. Okay, the votes are coming in definitely for some meditation. Right, okay, I'm not, see clearly I can't multitask, right? That's the website for the counseling service. As you can see, it's under DSSD. 
right? Right. So that's in the chat there. Um, okay, let's get some meditation going. Hang on, two seconds, two seconds. Let's get. Okay. Let's get a nice relaxing theme up. Okay. So again, you're going to sit back, relax those shoulders, relax the eyes. We're going to do visualization. So in fact, you're going to shut those eyes for this one for sure. So as you relax into your seat, as you relax those eyes, just take a moment to bring your attention back to your breath in through your nose and out through your nose. You're going to bring your attention to the feel of the air in your womb, the temperature of your air on your face and on your arms. Maybe you're noticing the cool air condition or breeze through your window or your fan. Just take a moment to figure whether it feels pleasant, unpleasant, or just neither. And now I want you to imagine yourself on a beach and with your shoes kicked off, you're gonna dig your feet into the sand, wiggle your toes in the sand, and just really pay attention to how that sand feels under the soles of your feet, between your toes. Is it gravelly? Is it soft and fine? Think about the temperature, is it nice and warm? Maybe it's cool and damp. Maybe you're standing near the water's edge. And as you relax on that beach with your eyes closed, you're gonna take a moment to listen to the sounds around you. Maybe you're hearing the breeze whistling through your hair or the trees around you. Maybe you're hearing the gentle waves. Maybe there are birds in the distance. Just focus on the sounds that you can hear on your beach. And on your imaginary beach with your eyes gently closed, I want you to raise your face to the sky and just notice the patterns of light on the backs of your eyelids and the feel of the sun on your face and on your neck. It's not raining on your beach, that's for sure. And it's not blazing hot either. So you're really just enjoying a nice, comfortable warmth. And just take a nice deep breath here. And then let that breath out really slowly, just enjoying this moment of calm, enjoying your personal moment on the beach, just relaxing, taking in the sounds, feeling the sand beneath your feet, and just generally feeling quite chill. Now we're going to gently leave that beach behind now because we have something else to do. You're gonna bring your attention to the feel of the chair at your back, the feel of the chair under your bum and under your legs, and the feel of the air in your room. And as you ground yourself in the space that you're in, just gently open your eyes. Okay, so welcome back everyone. I hope that um, that was a little bit of relaxing and you're ready for the next section. Enjoy the rest of your orientation. Uh, you have the email. I'm going to put it in the sta.ue.edu. I'm going to put it in the chat as well to everyone. If you want to have any questions you didn't get a chance to send, then just send them to me there. This is wizardry. Ha, <laughs> wonderful. Definitely needed that. Oh, lovely. Great. Okay. You're welcome, everybody. Good luck. Um, and take care of yourself and send me an email. Okay. Rhea and I think we're good. We are good, Dr. Chinyanki. And thank you so much for that presentation. I almost felt like I was on the beach. <laughs> almost shed a tear because it felt so real, so close yet so far. I, know, I, I always feel bad when I say, okay, leave the beach behind because I can actually hear moans in mind for my voice, okay? <laughs> thank you.
Okay, so Dr. Ramsaran, are you with us? Yes, I think I am. Hello and welcome to our orientation for our year one faculty students at the Faculty of Medical Sciences. I shall hand over to you now. Yeah. And you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, so I'd like to welcome our students to the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. And today, as requested, I'll be highlighting the professional services we offer at the Health Services Unit. I am Dr. Ramsaran, and I'm one of the physicians at the Health Services Unit. We are located on the main campus, the green building, which is labeled seven on this map. You can see it with our... We are located on the main campus and it's a green building located close to the Learning Resource Center. Our mission details and shows that we are committed to the promotion of optimum student healthcare through our friendly, efficient and holistic approach. We play an active role in campus safety and health, health and safety and provide an accessible healthcare services while promoting a healthy lifestyle choices, which is absolutely necessary in assisting students to optimize their physical and emotional well-being. Hence our policy by providing our accessible services to students with the aim of assisting them in achieving their optimal physical and emotional wellness. I wish to assure you that all the information that we hold at the Health Services Unit about your health is private and confidential. We do not share that information without your consent. Faculty, university, administration, and parents will not have access to your confidential medical records unless you sign a document stating that it's okay to share it. Written consent is required. However, if more than one healthcare professional at the unit is managing your treatment, relevant information may be shared. And our transformed approach because of at the time of COVID, we now are able to offer you telehealth services where you can access nursing appointments, our COVID-19 support group, dietetic services, physicians appointments, vaccination for COVID, pharmacy services, and health and wellness services. Telehealth services are a virtual medical service which where we use a secure Zoom platform and also on telephone as need arises. And it is by this means that you can contact our general practitioners, nursing staff, access our wellness, health and wellness site, pharmacy dietitian counselors are, dietitian and pharmacy consultations are easily accessible and from our health and wellness clinics we can also access virtual consultations in dermatology and dentistry how can you access these services please note the email sda hsu appointments at sda.uwi.edu or you can call at 662-2002, the university's number, and our extensions are 82149, 82153, 84455. We are available, our physicians are available every Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 a.m., but not on weekends or public holidays and we would assist you in addressing your urgent and non-urgent cases. However, all emergency cases are asked to visit their nearest health facility or private or seek private health care or call the ambulance service at 811. Nursing consultations at this time are limited to um, offering new family planning options and vaccinations. Currently, we have the Sinopharm, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines available for preventing COVID-19. The Sinopharm, as well as the 
Pfizer vaccines are two doses given 21 days apart, and the Johnson & Johnson is a single dose vaccine. You can contact our nurse at may and make appointments at STA on the web email website, which is shown here, the email address, or you can call at the numbers shown. On our website, there are forms which need to be filled. There's a first dose form and a second dose form, which you need to fill out prior to the administration of the vaccine. After your vaccination, you'll be observed for 10 or 15 minutes after administration in order to make sure that there are no immediate adverse reactions. So we would like to encourage you to please come and get vaccinated. The benefits of having a COVID-19 vaccine is that it prevents you from developing severe COVID, moderate to severe COVID illness, hospitalization and death, where it has been proven that 1% of the fully vaccinated, only 1% got sick with COVID-19. So it offers quite a lot of protection. You are less likely to have symptomatic or asymptomatic illness and hence less likely to transmit, which results in an overall reduction in transmission to the general population, which could then lead to lifting of public health measures. It allows you to be part of protecting others your family and your community because it contributes to herd immunity for those who are unable to be vaccinated for whatever medical reasons. So we'd like to urge you to kindly consider being vaccinated. At the Health Services Unit, especially at this time, we would also like to assist you in the mental and psychological support by having or asking you to access our COVID-19 support groups for students and staff and their dependents to deal with the impact in various ways of how COVID-19 have affected us in terms of anxiety, in terms of depression, in terms of losses and grief. We also have a grief and loss intervention group for staff, which can be requested from the head of department. Individual bereavement counseling is also available and sessions for post grief intervention is also accessible. Please note our email address and our phone numbers. Our pharmacy at this time can offer you prescription and dispensing services, pharmaceutical counseling, filling of CEDA prescriptions, purchasing of vaccines, namely the chicken pox and yellow fever. And we also do sales of personal care items, snacks and beverages. How it works is that students are required to pay an upfront cost of their prescription medication and then can then claim from the insurance claim form and receive up to 80% reimbursement on selected items. Staff members can utilize their Guardian Life Provisor card. Our responsible pharmacist is also willing to stock whatever medication you require if it is not currently available at the pharmacy. Please note that the pharmacy is also available on WhatsApp on 663-6524 and our extension through the university would be 82150. There's also the email hsu.pharmacy at sta.uwi.edu where you can scan and send in your prescriptions. Please also note that your original prescription must be presented on the collection of the medication. Our dietetic services will be able to offer you a personalized diet based on your health and lifestyle needs and addresses chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, weight management, whether it is that you wish to gain weight or whether you wish to lose weight, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and it's free for all actively registered students. You can book an appointment at HSU Dietitian at sta.uwi.edu.
And as a university student, you would have paid for medical insurance. We are, offer, we are able to offer you medical insurance through the Guardian Group Health Guard Plan, which is essentially an emergency service, but also assist in medical attention otherwise. And it is available to all financially cleared students. It is subjected, it will cover emergency plan. It's essentially an emergency plan, but it would cover all medical care requirements subject to the plan referral and pre-certification requirements. What you pay 100% expenses upfront, this is for non-emergency in most cases, and then you submit through the UE claim form and original receipts within 90 days. It has to be done within 90 days in order for you to benefit from what you can receive. Medical expenses, including of prescriptions, as well as investigations can be reclaimed. So access to the emergency services can be elicited in two ways. You can, once you are financially cleared and are registered, with the university, you can contact daily and medical services for pre-approval. That's if you need to visit a private medical facility. Once pre-approval is acquired, then it means that you will not have to pay a deposit in order to seek medical attention. However, you also have the option where you can pay 100% expenses upfront and submit a claim on using the form which is available. If you need to be awarded after your assessment, a awarding deposit fee may be required pending pre-approval from Davian Services. The Health Services Unit is also able to offer you two co-curricular courses. The first one would be a first aid CPR AED which can be undertaken as a three-day program, or it can be undertaken as a 12-week course where two credits are awarded. The certificate is given, is awarded by the American Heart Association and is valid for two years. Additionally, we offer a Meditation for Holistic Health, which is a 13-week, two-credit course program, which will allow you to gain personal balance Registration is now open for both courses and can be accessed by the co-curricular studies website. It is very, very important that I remind you to please complete your UE entrance medical form. Please complete all sections which are relevant to your faculty paying special attention to part A section five, where you enter your name in block letters and your address. Please ensure and sign your, your declaration and date your declaration. All of part B has to be completed by a healthcare professional, a doctor or a nurse. For medical sciences only, part C needs to be completed by a physician. And kindly remember to scan and email a copy of your immunization card. It's very, very important for the processing of your forms. Your MAN2 test and your chest X-ray has to be within the last six months. Please note that the deadline for submission is the 31st of December, 2021. And the hold medical and immunization holes are non-restrictive but that will not prevent you from being able to register for your courses. All forms must be submitted either to nurse at sda.uwi.edu or doctor at sda.uwi.edu. Please don't send to both, send to either one. Sick leave. Medical is very important for you to note. If you fall ill and you're unable to meet your academic responsibilities, whether it is attending PBL, whether it is um, on being unable to attend your labs, a sick note is required. The medical officer 
and Health Services Unit will be able to provide a medical excuse note only if we are involved in the care of the student. We cannot write excuse notes for illnesses and problems for which we did not administer care or medical illnesses which occurred in the distant past. And med the medical officers of the Health Services Unit will provide you with an excuse note for students who have been absent from examinations for category B medical illnesses only. And I refer you to exam regulation 27, one to four, where you can find further notes on that. It's very important as well that our medical, that your medicals are filled on our medical certificate form, which is available on our website. And it has to be completed by your attending physician and submitted within, 20, within seven days of missing your academic responsibility. Once again, I'd like to remind you of preventing COVID-19 by practicing social distancing, observing hand hygiene, placing face masks on properly and taking them off properly, avoid touching your face, seeking medical attention when you are unwell and staying at home if you are unwell. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. And if there are any burning questions, that I can answer, I'll be willing. Hi, Dr. Amtran. So at this point, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. In our chat. Um, I don't think this one is for health services because this one is talking about a chest clinic. Faith, I will answer you privately on that. Um, students are asking for the website link. The website link? Yeah. Also, there's another question. Even though classes are virtual, the medical is still a requirement. So they're asking about that. Yes, it is still a requirement. If we are to provide you with care, with your best care possible, yes, it is. And uh, student apps, uh, Classes are virtual now, but at some point in time, it may not be virtual. And this is a requirement by the universities to submit your entrance medical. Our website, you can access it through our through the health service, through the university's website. Okay. And we are we are health services unit. That's the link that you're looking for. Right. How long does it take to remove the medical hold? Is another question we've been asked. Well, as one would appreciate, we are receiving quite a lot of medicals at this point in time. Um, it should not be more than a week. Okay. Please, does the health services unit offer the rabies vaccine for veterinary students that need it? The veterinarian department usually arranges for the veterinarian students to be vaccinated. Right. And I believe it's done at the St. Joseph um, health center. So you can contact the veterinarian department. Great. Um, someone said they had a medical done two years ago and if it's still valid. The medical would be valid, but the chest x-ray on the mantu test may not be valid. Everything else should be valid. And we we'll need to check the immunization dates to know whether it is that you're still fully immunized. Right, another person is saying that you cannot take vaccines within a certain time period of each other, I think a couple of months. So how are we all recommended vaccines and TB screening before December the 31st? Well, the timing in preparation for the submission of the medical reports, for in in preparation for the, this entry medical, there is adequate time space. There's adequate in any event okay. that can be dealt with on an individual basis. Great. Um, last couple of questions about the holes. I submitted my medical form about two weeks and, and it was confirmed as completed, but the hole is still there. So what I'd advise you to do is to call us at 
662 2152 or 84455 and or send us an email and uh, leave your UA identification number as well as a contact number and we will look into it. Great. So thank you very much for your presentation again, Dr. Ramtran. It's very important to know um, in these times of a pandemic, you know, the uncertainties. We at the university have been very grateful for the provision of vaccines, myself included, I'm fully vaccinated. Yes. Um, you know, and the process was quite very um, well organized and easy to, to get through it. Great, I'm happy to hear that. That's the general feedback that we did get. Right. Um, so on that note, students, um, they are expressing their thanks to you. And I do wish to express thanks to all our presenters for today. Yes. And all our sessions are being recorded and a gentle reminder that they would be uploaded on our faculty website page. And they are also available on the UE YouTube station for the FYE, right? Tomorrow, we start again at 9 a.m. And this time we'll be talking about assessments online and PBL assessments, which is going to be facilitated by Professor Sa. I wish everybody a safe and good afternoon. Take care.